Hello and welcome to Summer Science Live. My name is Roma Agrawal and I'm a structural engineer and author. I'm really excited to be here at the Royal Society Summer Science Exhibition. Every year at Summer Science, we get to explore some of the strangest and most mind-blowing research from the UK and around the world. And this year is no exception. We have volcano detectives, a Mars rover on a mission, and a little tropical fish that could hold the key to better mental health. If you've never heard of the Royal Society, it's the UK's National Science Academy, and it's very old. In fact, it's so old that back when it started in the 1660s, science was a little bit different, investigating everything from unicorn horns to talking statues and mice falling in the sky in Iceland. If that sounds like your cup of tea, stay tuned because we're going to take a trip down into the Society's labyrinthine archive a little later on. But at the Royal Society, we're not just interested in the past, we're also looking to the future. Over the next three hours, we'll be bringing you all the latest cutting edge science from the exhibition floor, as well as some very special guests, such as Britain's first astronaut, Helen Sharman, and Michelle Doherty, who's leading an unmanned mission to the icy moons of Jupiter. It's a lot to cover and I won't be doing it alone. Neuroscientist and pyrotechnician Fran Scott is going to be my roving reporter. She will be down on the exhibition floor doing all the mucky and dangerous things so I can relax in my comfortable chair. Hi Fran, how are you doing? Hello, Roma. I am outside the Royal Society where people have been flooding in all morning. So let's join them and head inside. Summer Science Exhibition floor. My word, there is so much going on here. There's even someone dressed as a Brussels sprout. And I can't wait to meet the scientists and get hands on with all the weird and wonderful activities that are going on. Thanks, Fran. Um, remember, while you're here, you can subscribe to the Royal Society's YouTube channel. You can also follow us on social media at Royal Society. If you'd like to tweet throughout the show, please use the hashtag SummerScience. Now, if you live here in London, you might feel reasonably safe from volcanoes. In fact, the closest ones are in Italy and in Iceland. There's an ancient volcano 80 miles away in Cambridgeshire, but it's considered extinct. So don't bother trying to toast any marshmallows. But live volcanoes can be devastating. So scientists are doing everything they can to understand them better. Fran's going to find out more down on the exhibition floor. If you know me, you will know that I have an above average interest in fire. So I was really drawn to this stand first, all about volcanoes. And I'm here with Mikhail Camino Harry from the University of Oxford, who can explain a little bit more about this disco floor that we've got. It's not a disco floor, is it? It's not. So this is an Imaginarium. Of course it is. <laughs> So it shows you a cross section to the crust beneath a volcano in the Eastern Caribbean. Nice. The island is St. Vincent. And beneath the surface we have different magma reservoirs. Yeah. So we can imagine we have a deeper reservoir in purple. So the, pur then, the purple bit right here is the magma that's That's the very deep. Yeah. And then we have a mid-crustal reservoir in red and then a shallower reservoir in orange. Got yeah. And then you have some epic activity. And that's the, the flashing, flashing that lights. you can see. Yeah. Right. And this creates, well these fractures create earthquakes and connect these different reservoirs of magma and then as they connect you can see that they coalesce so now you have yeah. purple joining the red and then the red makes its way to the surface as you have more connections beneath. I think an eruption's coming isn't it? It is yeah. and then with more earthquakes eventually you have an eruption and that's the sound you're hearing there. So it's kind of like so, a schematic of how you will have 
unrest going into eruption. That is brilliant. And is this a simulation of an eruption that's happened, yes. you said? So in 2020, Slash of Friends St. Vincent erupted. It started with three months of dome forming activity and then transitioned to explosions afterwards. We Understood. can also look at this in terms of bird's eye view. Area nice, of the island. Yeah, so we're looking down. So this is the island of St. Vincent, let's imagine. And can I stand on you this? Can. It, it's so inviting. So if I stand here, yes. I understand that you are going to do things to this and I have to stand where it's safe, right? Exactly. So you can imagine this is the island and you have to decide as a resident where's the best place to. Uh, to, of course, to build your life. you're making it into a game, but it is quite serious stuff. Yes. This is a serious science that's happening about volcanoes. Lives are at risk. Decisions need to be made. Yes. And so using this information, but doing it in this way lets people understand it. Yes, exactly. Absolutely. So you have this island and you decided to, to set yourself I'm up here. I'm going to be here for now. I might move closer. I'll see where the, where the volcano, where the eruption happens. So then this is where the volcano is. Oh, OK. Right? Then you have some earthquakes related to the volcano, and then you have some gases. So, so far you're in a good spot because So yellow gases. is gas. Yes, this is a and gas. And the flashing is like the earthquakes, the earthquakes happening around. I don't know if I'm going to be safe. Let's see. <laughs> now you have some pyroclastic flows going right. that way, and you have some the ash cloud going this pyroclastic way. Pyroclastic flows being like lava flowing that over like the... superheated gas. Oh, gosh. That moves at a very high speed, and it kills people. Yeah, which is serious stuff. Yeah. yeah so so far, you've I've chosen. chosen a, yeah. But chosen. things don't always happen this way. But so far, and then as activity progresses, we see more activity oh, happening oh. this way. What does yellow mean? So yellow means we might have some lahars coming this way. So when we water interacts with ash. So I should probably evacuate, right? Yeah. I'm gonna go over here. So, of course, that's where scientists become important because they will warn you before. Absolutely, because you can't necessarily right. cross over that because no. it might be a danger zone. Yeah, so this is how the game becomes interactive and this is how you can get an idea of what it's like people living on volcan volcanic islands. Gosh, thank you so much. And yes, this is a game, but even though I'm stood here on a simulation, it is quite nerve wracking. And I suppose it, it puts it into perspective, the important work the scientists are doing. And then people like Macal that are making it really understandable for the next generation. But um, it's still a lot of fun to play, but back to you, Roma. Nice work, Fran. Now to tell us more, I'm thrilled to be joined by Richie Robertson, a volcanologist from the University of the West Indies. Welcome to Summer Science Live, Richie. It's great to have you here. Thank you, I'm glad to be here. Could you tell us a little bit about how you got interested in volcanoes and what led you to the career that you've been following? It's actually a long story, but I'll make it short. <laughs> um, I'm from the, from the island of St. Vincent the Grenadines. I'm from the island of St. Vincent. And in 1979, the volcano exploded, it had an eruption. At the time, I was in secondary school, I was in sixth form, and the eruption was so impactful. Um, you know, we woke up early in the morning, the volcano was erupting, and I just happened to be the person that went with my father towards the volcano to evacuate my grandmother. So the impact of the eruption, this, the spectacular nature of it, and then finally the fact that when the scientists came in to monitor the volcano to tell us what was happening, I realized that all of the scientists were coming from outside of the island and there wasn't mm -hmm. any Vincentian who knew about the volcano. Mm -hmm. And I took it upon myself, crazily, that I would become that person. And that is where I am now. That's amazing. How <laughs> yes. long have you been doing this as your career now? Well, I've been doing it since 19... 19... 87, I guess, okay. officially. So, yeah. you know, it's so long I, I could <laughs> stop counting the years. But, um, but interestingly, one of the things that have happened is that the volcano had an eruption in 2020, 2021, and I was able to come full circle mm. and be the person involved in providing that scientific guidance to the government and people of St. Vincent. So do you think, is that your favorite volcano or is it your least favorite volcano, I well, guess, in a way? <laughs> I, I guess in terms of how it looks, I think it's really a majestic mountain. Mm. Um, in terms of systems, I guess it's my favorite, it's one of the favorite ones, but there are a couple of, there are 19 volcanoes that we monitor in the region. So, you know, lots of volcanoes in Dominica and a couple of the islands are, are just as interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and what makes a volcanic, a volcanic system interesting to you? Well, I, I, I guess it's, it's a combination of things. Um, I'm particularly interested in, in trying to ensure that people can live safely in volcanoes. So 
I think if a volcano system is one which has um, vulnerable people close by, I'm particularly interested in trying to understand it better so that we could provide the guidance needed to get people out of the way in case of harm. I think for a lot of us, when we think of volcanoes exploding, it's what we've seen in Hollywood films. But could you tell us a little bit more about what the explosions or the eruptions actually look like? Well, the volcanoes in regions like in the Caribbean, which are subduction zone volcanoes, are ones that tend to explode. So that when the wow. magma, this, this molten rock comes to the surface, it breaks up into pieces and it has these big explosions that then send a lot of fine grain material and coarser grain material up into the air. Um, those are the spectacular ones that people are, you know, when people think of a volcanic eruption, they think of an explosion. But there are volcanoes like in Hawaii, like in Iceland, where you have some things there, the magma is not as explosive and it comes out as this sort of really red flowing mm. mass of rock that, that people could then sit down in the chairs and look at safely. The ones that are dangerous are the explosive ones. Yeah, no, I, and, I mean, I always think of there's a certain amount of beauty to the magma, isn't there? Maybe, how close have you been to magma and what, what has that experience been like for you? Perhaps in hindsight, in my early part of my career, a bit too close. You'd be too close. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, um, but yeah, I've, I've been in the, in the days of the Montserrat eruption, we were quite close because there's a certain amount of, you know, uncertainty and ignorance in terms of what we were doing, and we, but we were trying to collect data. Um, Depending on the kind of magma that is coming out, if it's more basalt, it tends to be more runny and, and it's probably safer to get close to it. But it's still quite hot, so you really should not get within a few feet of it because even as you get close, mm. it will, you, you can feel, kind of that feel heat. this heat coming off. If it's one of the volcanoes like in our part of the region, subduction zone volcanoes, which are explosive, you should you should Just stay run. several miles away from it because wow. those could, could produce things that can, can um, cause you great harm quite quickly. Yeah. I was really interested in what you said about scientists coming in from the outside. Can you tell us a little bit about the knowledge that the local people would hold about a volcano that you know, external scientists might not? Well, it, if you be, especially indigenous people, if you bear in mind that they have been the longest lived people in a particular region, they would have a lot of knowledge of past eruptions. Mm. And what we know from volcanoes is that the way in which they erupt in the past, often they erupt in a similar way in the future. So if you discount that knowledge, um, you discount a lot of the experiential knowledge that you could have that could inform us. So yes, the people who live on volcanic islands have a lot of experience dealing with volcanic eruptions, both in terms of how you can respond sensibly as well as the mad things that can happen. So one of the things that we try to do is try to get into that knowledge, try to learn as much as possible, not only from the rocks itself, which is important, but also from the people who live on the islands. Yes, yeah, so, I mean, it is really important, I think, to listen to the local people. Do you have any examples of when things have gone wrong when that hasn't been done? Yes, I do. And, and to do that, I'll have to go back to my favorite volcano, as I, as I mentioned before, which is La Soufre Volcano in St. Vincent. In 1902, it had an explosive eruption. And one of the things from looking at the past history we know is that there were some fisher women, some women who's, who, who got fish from one side of the island, went up the volcano, came down to another, uh, another village, and they sold the fish there. And what happened is that earlier on in the eruption, there was indication that the volcano was about to erupt, and they noticed this, this, these changes. And when they went to the village that they were selling in, they tried to alert the people, the people in, in Georgetown. They even went to the police station and told them, and they were, in fact, one of them was almost arrested because they told them they were being nuisances, so they went back. Um, and they only, the people in that village only realized what was happening when someone who was a plantation owner um, went up and saw it. But by then it was too late because the eruption had started and people actually ended up dying. Um, and that's one of the reasons why in our exhibition, in our exhibit, we're focusing on what we say learning from the past. It, it's about, there's a section about curating crises, sort of looking at past crises, mm -hmm. and we're exhibiting some of what we have learned from these past crises. Because for us, geology, the past is a key to the future, not only in the rocks, but in terms of the history from people. And we're trying to learn from these hidden voices, you know, these fisherwomen that you would never see in the records, we're trying to learn from what their experience was to tell us what could happen in the future. So, I mean, the moral of the story is listen to women. That's what I'm going to take away from this. Yes, yes, yeah, listen to everyone, especially women. Yes. Especially women. <laughs> Thank you so much, Richie. It's been really great to chat to you. Now, from the explosive surface of our own planet to the rocky landscape of another world. Over to you, Fran.
That is right, Roma. I am actually here on Mars, if you couldn't tell, but I am not alone. Don't worry. I have some guides here. I've got Samit Mahajan and her Roki Cook from University of Southampton. So why have we got a slice of Mars right here, Samit? Well, we've got a slice of Mars to actually explain the technology which we're developing in this part of uh, Enlighten Us program, a large collaboration between Nottingham, Edinburgh and Southampton, which is using a technology called Raman Spectroscopy. And Raman Spectroscopy, in, in Raman Spectroscopy, you shine a laser on a material, and the molecules in the material start to vibrate. And when they vibrate, they give off different colors. By recognizing the different colors, which is actually the chemical fingerprint, you can tell what the constitution of those chemicals are, whether they constitute might, might be life, or they might be disease, which I'm going to talk about later. Brilliant. And this is new technology, isn't it, with the laser and then like sort of looking at different chemicals and going, OK, that one's made of this, this one's made of BC, D and E, and this one's made of that. That's correct. And NASA recognized this technology. It's actually an old technology, but re 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 reinvented because advancements in lasers, advancements in detection and so on. But rec and NASA recognized the importance of it. And that's why they have it on their rover, currently looking for signs of life on planet Mars. So could we drive your rover? You can, absolutely. Actually, the big rover is a replica of their rover, but we have a smaller one to play a game with. This one little here. OK, I'm up for games. Hiroki, I've heard you've got a button to yep. press down here. That. So the real rover, we'll point out just before we play the game, is modeled after Mars Perseverance using the same te Raman technology that is in Supercam and in Sherlock. This was built by our interdisciplinary team. So scientists from different disciplines came together. So physicists, chemists, biologists, mathematicians, computer scientists, to build this rover very similar to the NASA engineers who put the, together the real thing 140 million miles away. So the real and thing- this is smaller than the one that's on Mars, or is it the same size? The real one is the size of a hatchback car. Okay, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so today, yeah, we'll drive an even smaller one, because the big one's asleep at the moment, but you'll be able to go to each of these targets as it flashes around, and we'll see if we fire our laser, look at our chemical fingerprint with Raman spectroscopy, and see whether life there exists. Brilliant, and this is the controller That's here, it. right? So Do you trust the, me? I <laughs> trust oh, you. Oh, you might regret that. <laughs> Drive okay. the rover around, hit that button, and we'll see whether there's life. We'll look okay. at the chemical fingerprint and see there's life. Okay, so we'll start the game. Oh, we'll so the lights move. Yep, All right. See I thought I had it easy with that no, one. No, no, no. <laughs> Oh, it was that one. Oh, good, 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 okay. Oh, very good, good, very good. Go on. Oh, no, 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 too much, too much. <laughs> let's wait, let's wait. Oh, 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 oh. Oops. Oh, oh, brilliant. Oh. Yeah, yeah, line up just a little bit more. Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> so close. Oh, back. Very good. Yeah, that's it. Straight, straight ahead. Oh, oh wait, now I press the button. Yes. Press okay. the button. Yes. Oh, and it's, yep. Yeah. Oh. And it we brings up the chemical, fingerprint. the chemical fingerprint. And this is this Raman spectroscopy. Raman spectroscopy giving us a unique identifier telling us whether there's evidence of past microbial life. Brilliant. And then you're using this to sort of draw on people's imaginations and entice right. them in. But the research that you're doing is over here, isn't it, Samir? Absolutely, Thank absolutely. You. So, so, so this chemical fingerprint acquisition, as, as you just saw, which can happen on Mars, which is happening right now, Actually, we use that research, we use that idea to diagnose diseases, diseases much, much earlier than actually they manifest themselves. So we're looking at uh, diseases like osteoarthritis, and you see that you know uh, there, there are different fingerprints. This is how the fingerprints look like. You know, the, these peaks correspond to the vibrations, and a spectrum corresponds to the chemical fingerprint. That is absolutely fascinating. So you can use the same technology that they're using with the Mars rover to then analyze the chemical fingerprint of within bones when it comes to osteoarthritis yes. to detect the disease before the person that has it might even know. That's exactly correct. And then and, and you see as, as you can then do a library comparison with a database. And, and this is not the only application. That's the fantastic thing about it. Actually, you can apply this on other diseases. We are trying to do it in skin cancer melanoma detection, but it could be applied to neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's and so on and so forth. So it's really a fundamental discovery and which is having a large impact both in outer space, but also can make a real difference to the lives of people on planet Earth. Absolutely, it's a tool that you can use in many different ways. And to tell us more about this research, I know Roma, you have a guest with you right now. Fran, it looks like you're having a bit too much fun there, so um, thank you. I'm now delighted to be joined by Amanda Wright from Nottingham to tell us more. Amanda, welcome to the sofa. Thanks, it you. Um, can you tell us a bit about the project that you're working on? 
Yeah, yeah. So it's a large um, project that spans three different universities. So I'm from Nottingham University, as you said, and I've got some colleagues at Southampton and Edinburgh University who are also involved. And we're a big multidisciplinary team. There's um, biologists involved, clinicians, computer scientists, engineers, chemists. So we span a really wide range of disciplines. And we're all trying to take on quite a big challenge of trying to image deep inside the human body. So that's the, the challenge that we're trying to tackle at the moment. And that's a technology that's also used to look for life in outer space, like 320 million miles away. So can you tell me a bit about that link? Yeah, yeah. So some of the technologies we're using are linked to also what's happening um, on Mars at the moment. So there's a, a technology called Raman spectroscopy, and that's being used on the Mars rover to try to, under, um, try to identify life on Mars, which is very exciting. And we're using it to try to un, uh, identify different molecules that are present in the body. So using it, we can identify if somebody's got arthritis, if a tissue is cancerous, if not cancerous, and it's all using that same technology. Now, um, the word spectrum is associated with light for yeah. me. So can you t talk us through what, what spectrum means to you and then what Raman spectroscopy means? Yeah, sure. So you're, you're right. We use a lot of different technologies involving light. So with Raman spectroscopy, you illuminate your sort of material of interest that you're trying to identify with a single wavelength or a single colour using a laser. And that laser, um, that all the individual molecules inside the material get excited by that laser and vibrate at different frequencies. And depending on the frequency they're vibrating at, they change the colour of the light. So essentially we put one colour in mm -hmm. and we look at all the different colours that come back from that material. And all those colours give us a kind of fingerprint or a spectra of what is present in that material. So we can use it to identify at the molecular level what molecules are in a material. So on um, Mars, they use it to say, is carbon present and therefore is life present in this material we're looking at? And we use it to look at the human body to say, yeah, is, is, is there signatures of cancer here or is there signatures of arthritis? Um, what's going on? So can you tell me a little bit about maybe how a cancer cell would respond differently than a healthy cell to this particular technique? So it's all about the different molecules that are there and that are involved and how those molecules vibrate. So it lets us identify the different molecules that are present and, and how they're vibrating in the case of cancerous and healthy tissue, for example. Um, so for um, joints, we've got some people on the project who are very interested in arthritis and a, a signature there is how much collagen is surrounding the joint. So we and that's can a type of it. protein, isn't it? Yeah, so yeah. we can use it to say, is it present or is it not present? And if it's degraded, how much is it degraded by? And therefore, um, what sort of um, state the disease is in? How is the disease progressing by looking at um, the collagen being present, like you said, this protein being present and the structure of it. So is it a diagnostic tool, a bit like MRIs and X-rays, for example? Yeah, yeah, that's how we plan to use it as a way of diagnosis. And the idea is that, um, that it, it's a, a sort of natural property of the material that you're looking at. So we're not having to put anything additional into the material and that makes it quite uh, minimally invasive. So we should be able to do it um, sort of in a way that doesn't um, sort of cut into the patient or cause any yeah. damage to the patient. Or you're not, you're not like ingesting dyes or, no. you know, other kinds of things like that. No. And, and could you tell me maybe a little bit how it might differ from x-rays or MRIs or CT scans? Because again, you know, those are forms of radiation, aren't they? Yeah. And, and yeah. we shouldn't be exposed to some of those forms of scanning too often. So maybe yeah. could you talk us through a bit about the different types of scanning yeah. and what's great about Raman yeah. spectroscopy? Sure, Thank no you. problem. Yeah, so um, x-ray, um, um, x-rays as you mentioned they're very good at showing up the bones in their body something that we're all very familiar with but yes they can be damaging so you know when you go to have an x-ray the, the technician often has to stand away and you can only have so many in well, a they've got like a time. lead apron or something yeah. on isn't it yeah, yeah. that's <laughs> correct yeah so that's because it, they're very very high energy and therefore they can cause some damage they, they're what we call ionizing radiation so they can change the property of what you're looking at so right. light comes under the form of non-ionizing so therefore it can't um, it doesn't have enough energy to cause those changes so if we choose our light very carefully, we can choose it in a way as not to damage what we're looking at. So that's a really nice benefit over X-ray. MRI, again, is a great technique, but it's, um, very, exp it's very expensive mm. in the clinic. It's very noisy. Some patients find it quite unpleasant. So we feel there's a real niche where um, kind of optical techniques can add. And actually, it has this really nice property of being able to, in the case of Raman, identify what molecules are present. And it also gives um, amazing resolution. So you can see things much smaller in the body than 
than you can with MRI. You can see individual cells, individual components in cells. So the resolution you get um, far exceeds X-ray and MRI. So it's got a kind of, it's got some nice benefits to offer in that space. Oh, absolutely. So if yeah. I went to the hospital and I was going for, I don't know, is it called a Raman scan? What would that yeah. look and feel like as a patient? Yeah, so the technology um, is kind of working its way to that sure. point. Um, but yeah, it should be something a little bit like a, maybe an OCT scan that you've had in your eye. That's an optical technique that scans in the body. So um, yeah, you'd have a, um, a light would be shone at the part of the body that um, you were having your scan. And then there'd be some clever sort of sensors and detectors looking at the wavelengths of the light coming back from the sample. And um, let's let's talk a little bit about history. I'm always so yeah. interested in the history of where things yeah. come from in science yeah. and engineering. So tell us a bit about Raman himself. Yeah, yeah. So Raman was an Indian physicist. Um, yeah, C.V. Raman was his name. And um, he discovered this, this um, property of this Raman spectroscopy and this shift in the wavelength of light. And he um, won the Nobel Prize for that discovery in 1928. So yeah, made a very important contribution to science. So quite a kind of 20th century technique, yeah. really. Yeah, so it's, uh, it's the sort of fun fundamentals of the technique have been known about for a long time and it's one of those techniques that's constantly finding kind of new uses and new new ways in which we can employ it on Mars or in the body. Um, so yeah, so the, the challenge at the moment is really this trying to image deep into the human body and, and we're sort of developing um, kind of new lasers and new ways of shaping light and some new AI to allow us to do that to get the, the Raman spectroscopy signal from as deep as possible into the body because that's where it has the applications. That's brilliant. And I just think it's wonderful that it's a multidisciplinary team because, you know, for me, that's such an important part of yeah. science, isn't it? Yeah, um, yeah. It's yeah. what I love and it's what I enjoy. <laughs> and it's really nice kind of just sharing ideas and you learn something at every meeting. So it's fantastic. No, that's brilliant. Thank you so much for your time, no Amanda. Problem. It's been a pleasure. Yeah, thank you very much for having me. My next guest is Helen Sharman, who is a chemist and Britain's first ever astronaut. Since her trip to the Mir space station back in 1991, she has been a brilliant, skilled science communicator, enthusing and awing audiences all around the world. Britain's first astronaut is in space. The Soyuz spacecraft carrying Helen Sharman and two Soviet cosmonauts was launched successfully this afternoon from the Baikonur Space Center in the Soviet Union. Helen, it's such an honour to have you here. Um, can you tell us a bit about your, I guess, your science background to start off with? Well, I ended up studying a science degree after school, but I really couldn't decide what to choose. Um, I love animals, music, foreign languages and sciences, and I liked all of that at school. And I was really, you know, which one to study. And honestly, I wasn't very adventurous, so I didn't really think much about the stuff that you don't know from school, like the engineering subjects. So I was thinking, well, if I did chemistry, it was a kind of an in-between science and perhaps I could go one way or the other. As long as it was a STEM subject, then that would open options for me later on that might not be open to me if I'd done something else. So yeah, I decided chemistry, that's what I studied. And I mean, what an option it opened to you. I know. Um, talk about this advert that you heard on the radio. So yeah, I was working for Mars Confectionery actually at the time, which is a great name for a company if you're going to be an astronaut. But I've got no idea when I started working there that that's what I was going to be. So um, yeah, I was just driving my car home from work, as you do, listening to the radio. Um, though I had one of those radio stations in the car, radio, radio sets where you push the button and the next station up the dial kind of just dials mm. in automatically mm. tunes in. And um, I kept pushing the button, trying to find some decent music. And then I heard an announcement, astronaut wanted, no experience necessary. And it described this brand new opportunity, never been around for people like me in Britain, mm. just to apply to be an astronaut. Um, there hadn't been a British astronaut before. Yeah. Um, and so this was a special space mission created for the first British astronaut to go and do experiments on a space station. And wow, you know, what an opportunity. And it was going through my mind, yeah, that'd be fantastic. And the first criterion was you must have a STEM subject education. Didn't matter what, what STEM was, subject, yeah. but as long as it was a STEM subject. Thought, yeah, I've got chemistry, I could do that. <laughs> oh, but they'll not choose me. 
course they won't choose me, right? They're yeah. bound to choose somebody who's military, a pilot. And I was going to ask, that. like, did you have, like, I don't know, were you super athletic and into sports or something? Well, I was reasonably fit and healthy, mm. but nothing, you know, I didn't run marathons. I was no Olympian or anything like that. Um, I just enjoyed keeping fit and and. and doing bits of sport every now and again. Um, but, and that, yes, we had to be reasonably healthy and fit. That was, sure. medicals were part of the selection. Um, and also to have, to be quite familiar, I suppose, with other foreign languages, because we had to learn to speak the Russian language very quickly, because all the training was going to be done in the Russian language. Wow. So, um, so the ability to learn Russian was going to be important. And because I had previously loved learning foreign languages, you know, when I was at school and I couldn't decide what to choose. So actually it all came in the end. It was almost like the perfect job, even though I could never have imagined when I was at school, yeah. when I was choosing my degree, mm -hmm. that choosing that STEM subject could lead to something like that. And did the music ever come back in? I took some music into space with oh, me. Okay, and actually, recently, <laughs> I've been able to play keyboard with Richard Hawley. Um, yes, in, a, in some of the live concerts in Sheffield. Absolutely fabulous. So it does, does come useful sometimes. No, I, I, love, I love the idea that it's not just the science, but also, you know, the languages, the music and everything that kind of plays into making you an all-rounded astronaut, really. Well, you can't be a boring person in space, right? You're going to really <laughs> cheese off all your crewmates if you're really dull. And I think it's important not to take yourself too seriously as well. You've got to know when it's important to focus, to mm. do what you need to do, and then you know to relax and enjoy being a person, being an individual with your crewmates um, and, and trusting each other. And, and you need to have both of those things going on. Was there any very scary moment while you were on your way there or on your way back or, or there, in fact? I would say never really scary because mm. we understood what was going on and what we had to do. Um, the most, I suppose, um, unexpected moment was when the alarms all went off not long after I'd arrived on the space station. And it turned out that we didn't have enough electrical energy in the batteries because the solar panels hadn't been directed towards the sun as well as they should have done. And some were masked by a new module that had just been added to the space station. And after we arrived, you know, it was thought that maybe we'd just have enough electrical energy to pull us through when we were around the dark side of the Earth. But we didn't. <laughs> and right. so the uh, emergency signals went off. Um, the commander sort of floats off to the control panel um, and immediately comes back to everybody and explains what's going on. Yes, OK, so we just have to make sure we can move into fresh air because you don't get the normal air circulation mm. currents that we do on Earth. And so you need to make sure you don't suffocate in your own buildup of carbon dioxide. So you keep moving around. But because of our training, we knew that. Mm -hmm. And then once we come back round the Earth into the sunshine again, solar panels absorb solar energy electrical energy, the lights came on because the lights had all gone off, right? Um, all fans had gone off to try and conserve power. So yeah, wow. so that was supposed the most unexpected. That was intense. Time. That sounds, I mean, I mean, the, it, for me, for someone who doesn't really like flying and doesn't love heights, I mean, the idea of being kind of shot off the Earth's surface at high speed doesn't sound particularly appealing. But if you're trained, you know what you've got to do. Mm. And I think that's the thing is that I would be scared if somebody told me I was going into space tomorrow because <laughs> I wouldn't know what I had to do. I wouldn't know the mission. I wouldn't know that particular spacecraft possibly. But if your training is good, if you really, you know, we're scared of the unknown, I think. Mm. So if, you, if you're scared of something, my, my story, you know, I always say, get the knowledge about it. Yeah, 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 yeah. And how long did you have to train for the eight days that you spent in space? Yeah, eight days in space, 18 months training. Wow. Now, 18 months is quite a short training yeah. period for astronauts who are going to be career astronauts. Mm. So if you're going to be, a, let's say, European Space mm. Agency, employed astronaut, then they train for five years or more before they even get their first sniff of a space flight, um, mm. some for yeah, much longer. Yeah. Um, but then they're training for all sorts of different missions. Mine was already very, very specific. We knew what we were going to have to do in space. The mission was assigned. So yeah, 18 months. Brilliant. And tell me a little bit about what you've been doing since those eight days, because I'm sure you're fed up of getting questions about these eight days many years ago oh, now. No, but it's, it's, um, tell honestly, me what you're doing now. It's lovely to talk about it still. And I, I know partly because it's, it's, um, it was fun time for me, but it's, if people are interested, then that's nice. It's nice mm -hmm. to, to talk about something, because it wasn't just my mission. It was a British space mission. So I do feel I, I do, should share it. But no, subsequently, it's been great to, um, to get involved in science communication, not the 
ever thought I would want to do that. Um, I was very, very shy. Um, even in the space, I was quite shy. So I didn't mind sort of chatting on the radio. Even doing some TV work was fine because um, if it was a TV camera, it didn't feel like there was loads of people. But when I was first asked to go and give a speech in front of a large audience, oh my goodness, I was so worried about that. But then I started to go into some schools and I, um, I'd set up a program of, um, of sort of talks around schools not long after my space flight. And I thought really, it was really to tell them about my space flight. And the teachers were saying, well, you know, this is great, but actually, it's so good for the science. And this is the curriculum for this age group and so on and so on. <laughs> and the teachers were brilliant at, at helping me to understand mm -hmm how to turn a story about space into what's really relevant. basic science. So whether yeah. you're talking electrolysis or convection mm -hmm. or radiation, um, all of that, Newton's laws, you know, chemical propulsion, there's so much yeah. um, that it's just basic science. And so I started to think, my goodness, yeah, this is something that would be really a useful thing to put my mission to. So yeah, so I started thinking and talking about science. Yeah. Bringing science to life, what an amazing well, like thing to, to do. So. Yeah, it's been, it's been great fun. <laughs> That's great. Helen, we've talked a bit about that feeling of being blasted off into space, but what was it like coming back? Well, returning to Earth is actually the, a, a bigger ride in some respects because you get more G mm -hmm. of deceleration. So we had about five and a half G of deceleration coming back through the atmosphere. It's only about four and a half during the launch. Um, and it's quite bumpy as well um, as you come through different layers of the atmosphere. Um, and, and you start to see glow around the outside of the spacecraft, which is the plasma building up around the outside. So as the upper layers of the atmosphere get really hot, they get charged and they start to give off this light. Um, so yeah, it's quite wow. an exciting time really. And then the parachutes open up and then finally just about a meter and a half above the ground, we get some retro rockets just to make the landing a bit softer. But it is still a bit of a bump. Did, and did you, you came down on land as opposed to water? Yes, in your exactly, particular dry case. land. So that yeah. was where we'd intended to land. So okay. yes, SpaceX will bring their crew back uh, into water and that's yeah. planned, but we'd planned to come, on dry, to come on dry land. And then you, you, I don't know, you come out of the module and then you kind of step back onto Earth. What is that like? I suppose it's getting used to feeling balance again for me. So I'd been into space for what, eight days. It wasn't long enough to really have weak muscles. And so to feel physically like I couldn't really stand up very much. Um, some astronauts feel quite faint as well if they've been in space a long time because suddenly blood is pulled away down towards their feet, away from their heads. Um, but that wasn't, for me, an issue. It was more um, just a balance. I felt a bit wobbly. And so <laughs> when yeah. I wanted to walk, my leg felt really heavy. So I had a natural <laughs> tendency to lean over when I picked my leg up <laughs> and then I put it down. And then when I picked my other leg up, that felt heavy. So I, <laughs> so I was kind of walking in this wobbly way. It took about 20 paces okay. to to retrain my brain. It's pretty quick, I mean, to be honest, considering what a huge change so physically it is, isn't adaptable. it? Adaptable. I mean, yeah. human beings, human bodies are yeah, fabulous. Amazing. Um, what was it like as a woman in space? Was there sexism surrounding your launch? And so, I mean, one of the things I do remember is when the press came out a few years ago when Tim Peake went up into space. They were calling him the first British astronaut. And I was shouting at the telly going, no, he's the first <laughs> male astronaut if you want to do that. Um, he's the second British astronaut. But yeah, what was your experience from that well, yes, it wasn't totally with Tim Peake. It wasn't Tim's fault. It wasn't the media's no, fault either. No. <laughs> it was the UK space agency who actually told the media <sighs> that he was Tim Peake was the first British astronaut. So yes, that was um, a, a bit of a naughty thing to do, mm. um, putting it mildly. But um, but no, in terms of my space flight, it was it was great. I mean. The, I, trained with the Soviets. The Soviets, communists had had women train drivers, engineers, astronauts. Um, they knew they needed their women as part of the workforce way in advance of you know, people in Western Europe waking up to the same idea. So it was, uh, it was great. I mean, they have a, a different kind of culture socially. So, uh, you know, uh, men would take my coat off for me and hang it up. Very nice. <laughs> what about your spacesuit? Was that <laughs> no, no, I did my own spacesuit. <laughs> but, but yeah, but basically when it came to work, it was, I was just treated as, as yeah. one of the crew and that was lovely. And um, that's a really good way of looking at it. Now, t uh, tell me about alien life. Do you think alien life exists? It must do somewhere. I think you know, we would be quite an arrogant species, wouldn't we, to think that you know only only our, us in terms of intelligent life uh, in, in the whole universe with all of those stars, all of those planets, surely somewhere, whether or not we'd recognise it as intelligent, mm. whether or not um, 
it really is made of carbon. I know a lot of scientists say, oh, carbon complex, you know, so it has to has to be carbon based. But I just wonder, could it possibly be silicon? And then other people will say, well, what about the temperatures? Yeah, but we don't know what the temperatures and conditions are in many Everywhere. places. So yeah. I think somewhere there must be, but um, certainly it would be so exciting to find evidence mm. of some sort of life, whether or not we'd call it alien or intelligent. So we have a little surprise for you now. Um, we have a question for you from Professor Brian Cox. Should we have a listen? Helen, we, we saw the launch of Starship, right? this monumental SpaceX rocket that's supposed to be the future of uh, crude space exploration. Um, and it kind of demolished the launch pad and it didn't work very well. <laughs> So, so what's your feeling? How optimistic are you that uh, these giant spacecraft are going to be voyaging out to the moon and perhaps even onwards to Mars, let's say within the next 10 years or so? That's an interesting question, isn't it, from Brian? Yes. So I think there's a future is for a lot of commercial spacecraft, whether they're giant ones, as Brian said, or whether actually they're going to be quite a few other smaller ones as well. And they're going to be, we're going to need a mixture of them. Um, but yes, I do think that ultimately we will have a few giant ones going off into space and the giant ones will be needed to go perhaps further than we've ever been before. And I suppose that's Elon Musk's dream is to be able to get his rocket to Mars. Um, but yeah, we're going to need a variety of different uh, launchers because space is becoming so much more accessible affordable mm. for a lot of researchers. And I can see a time when it's not just people who are astronauts who go into space, but people who are researchers, they might be employed in industry or by some institution, and they will need to do their research in space. So a lot more of us will have the chance to experience it. I mean, that sounds brilliant. I'm a big Star Trek fan, so I can't wait to get onto some kind of spaceship and go for a bit of an exploration. Um, it's been absolutely brilliant to chat to you, Helen. Thank you, and it's been my pleasure. Now, if you are a fan of rock music, you're going to love our next exhibit. Fran is down there in the mosh pit. Can you hear me, Fran? Um, Fran, can you hear me? Oh, sorry, Roma, I was in my own little world then, but it's a world that is about to be joined with Marcus from the University of Chichester and Jules from Roland. So obviously we have the drum kit, but what has that got to do with science? So we're building up this scientific understanding of the drummer. So we, what we want to expose you to today is a little bit of an insight into the technical requirements and the physical requirements of drumming. So if I'd like to pass you over to Jules, my colleague from Roland, he'll give you some basic instruction and let's see where we end up. Oh gosh, that sounds a bit ominous. Uh, so <laughs> what is it that we're going to do, Jules? Okay, Fran, so I'm going to teach you to play a really basic drum beat and what we call a drum fill as well. Okay, really basic, yeah? For sure, Totally for sure. be able to do it. So actually what you're going to do here is you're going to use four limbs independently of one another and coordinate them in order to be able to play this beat. Right. So what I'd like you to do is to start by playing the hi-hat here with your left hand and I want you to count a nice four beat. Right, so, so like one, one two, two, three, four. four. Great. One, two, three, So then we're going to introduce the kick drum and we're going to put that on beats one and beat three. So one, two, three. <laughs> I've got it, I've got it, get it right, right. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. <laughs> totally got it. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Amazing. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, Three, this is the hard bit. This is the, bit. this is the easy bit. I'm concentrating. One, two, three, four. And the one, next two, part is you're three, going to introduce four, this one, drum two. here called the snare drum. There's on more. Beats. Oh yeah. All right. Okay. So you're going to put that on beats two and beats four. So, so the big drum down here with the kickboard, uh, three and no. One and three. One. Totally got it. One and three. This one on two and four. And this one on all four. Yeah. All at the same time. Go for it. One, two, three, eight. and I thought patting your head and rubbing your belly was it? Okay, so one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Amazing, you got it, you Did got I? it. Yeah, absolutely. Really? That's it. You've been it. kind. And then the last thing we'll do to finish off with the drum fill, so we're going to go. So I do this or I just do, do I do it all or just this bit? You can bring it all together. Okay, okay, okay. Oh, are you ready? <laughs> right, so one, two, three, four. One, two. <laughs> one, two. I could have been here all day. One, two, three, four. Oh, do you know what? That is not easy, is it? So if I could just ask you to 
to go back to just counting on the one. Yeah, one, two, three. So your heart four. is now pumping. It really is. It, it, it really is. So if you can, that's roughly 60 to 70 beats per minute at rest. If you can play as fast as you can with both hands on that high hat now. Right. That's awesome. So in a gig, someone like Clem Burke playing with Blondie will reach 180 to 190 beats per minute. Oh gosh. So imagine that level of concentration, 80,000 people expecting yeah. you to hit every note. That is the world of the elite drummer that we're looking to share with everybody. Isn't and I think I could see you at Glastonbury <laughs> next year. Absolutely, a headlining, but I've worked up a sweat here. It is like, you're, so, you're a performer, right? Doing this. Yeah, it, so very interesting for us. Drummers drop two litres of fluid per hour, which is similar to a world-class endurance athlete. Oh, gosh. So I think gosh. after we've finished, it might be the time for a slight beverage. <laughs> I'm always up for that. Roma, you should come and join me with the drums and with the beverage. This is great. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you. Fran, I'm getting some real animal from the Muppets vibes from you, but I think we're going to have a slightly more chilled out chat here in the studio now. Um, I've got Ruth Lurie with me. She's a sport and exercise psychologist, and she's here to tell me more about what we've just seen. Um, hi, Ruth. Hello there. Great to have you here. Nice to meet you. Um, how long have you been drumming? So I'm, I'm not a drummer myself. You're not a drummer no, yourself. No, <laughs> no, so I'm, I'm the one with the clipboard behind observing and um, recording different data. <laughs> Are you interested in music? I mean, what brought yes. you to this um, particular line of work? So um, it's probably a bit of a long story, but I, I used to be a nursery nurse before I went to university. So I had another career before I then went as a mature student to university. And I've always had an interest in music and its um, ability to reach out to children. Um, so then when I um, started a, a job in particular, um, I used the psychology then to try and understand the, the benefits of music for, for children, in particular rock drumming. Why rock drumming in particular? So one of my colleagues um, at the time, Dr. Marcus Smith, um, who's our professor, um, he he had looked at the physiological demands of elite, if you like, or professional drummers. And what he found was that as they go across a concert, which might last 90 minutes, they're expending as much energy as an athlete might spend wow. in a 90 minute um, football match or a competitive bout. So. If you imagine that they're doing that night after night, not just on, at the weekend, um, they need to think about bo both their preparation and their recovery so that they can finish the, the tour, if you like, that, which might run for six months. Um, so as we, we talked about that research, we had a lot of parents would come and tell us that children who had um, autism, who had dyspraxia, dyslexia, really benefited from rock drumming. So we, we wanted to set out and provide evidence for that. It's really interesting because, you know, my initial reaction would be that, oh, calm classical music or violins or like a nice little piano thing would be the thing that calms, you know, a child down or that might make you feel more, you know, at ease with yourself or whatever. So, so what is it about the rock drumming that you're finding in particular that actually brings that sense of, I don't know, peace or stability? So it's interesting that you say that because we see, see similar parallels to um, sport and exercise. Mm -hmm. So people assume that after doing sport or exercise that you might have elevated mood. So you might be running around and still continue to be um, uh, hy hyperactive. Um, but what we see is, is almost the opposite, that they have that experience and then there's a calming period. Mm -hmm. So it, it's about the concentration and the absorption in the moment and then after that, that just leaves them with a sense of satisfaction, having learned something that they enjoy um, and they really want to do. So I like knitting and crochet. And someone told me that because I'm using kind of both my hands and both sides of my brain to, to do that, that is actually quite therapeutic. Is there some parallels with the drumming? Yes. So with, with knitting, what you'll find is that it's very... Um, when, when you start to knit, mm. you, you're, you're very mindful of what you're doing. So everything's very laboured. And you might have used those old analogies of knit one, purl one, um, slip off, and those sorts of elements. With drumming, drumming instructors use a similar technique. So they use words like paradiddle, paradiddle. And that's to mi mimic the sound that they're looking for, and particularly the difference between one stick and the other. 
As you then perfect the skill, you drop the words, you don't need them anymore, and you become less conscious of what you're doing and it becomes much more um, automatic. Um, so you might have noticed that you can watch the TV or have a conversation with somebody else. As you now met. I can, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, the, what the drummer can do is that they can vary the routine, they can um, have a conversation with other people um, around them, they can interact with the rest of the band. So you kind of go into this almost flow meditative sort of state? Yes, and that's a word that, that psychologists use, uh, is one of flow. Mm -hmm. So that feeling of being um, unconscious and not aware of what you're doing, and that can be calming and relaxing. And so does the, I guess the beneficial effects of the drumming wear out if you're in the flow and I, I guess just going with it? Is, it? is it the act of learning the new skill that's therapeutic? Like, is that part of your research? So the, there, there are two aspects to it. So learning a new skill is beneficial in itself because you're creating new pathways within the brain. So it's what we call brain plasticity or, or neuroplasticity that you might have heard of. And that can happen. It was, it was often thought um, that, that it only happened up to a, a particular age within youth, but you can teach an old dog new tricks. You know, there, there is benefits then for, for people and it's been used within rehabilitation for people with brain um, difficulties. But the, the learned skills that you have, they're relaxing because they are so automatic. So you, that's why you see some people with fidget spinners or um, tapping out a technique because it's a simple thing that they've learned over time and therefore it's relaxing for them. And what is the outreach work that you're doing with children in relation to your research? Yes, yeah, so what we find is that when we've gone in to do a, a research project, it often has a finite cutoff point. Um, usually due to funding. Um, and when that comes to an end, what we do is we tend to leave the kits that have been provided for us as part of that research with the school. And um, the teachers have often seen the benefits, so they then um, look to resource um, paying for the drum instructor to continue on with that. So we've got a number of different schools across England, so in Liverpool, Bedfordshire, West Sussex, uh, Gloucester, Forest of Dean that we're working with. That sounds brilliant, and it sounds like I should get my four-year-old a drum kit, um, or, or maybe not. Or maybe not. Actually, <laughs> I don't think I want to listen to her drumming at home. Well, the benefit is that that people often asso associate drumming with the acoustic set. Yes. <laughs> that the noise that you hear is the noise that you get, whereas the the drum kits that we use are electronic, so they come with a pair of headphones. Right. So your daughter would hear the music, and all you would hear is tapping on on the rubber pads of the. I it. think I could probably cope with that. Absolutely. Um, thank you so much. It's been really <laughs> fascinating. You. Now, um, I'm hoping that Fran has managed to tear herself away from the drum kit and move on to our next exhibit. Yes, I have moved swiftly on to the Young Researcher Zone, where 10 school groups from across the UK are presenting some of the projects that have been funded by the Royal Society's Partnership Grant Scheme. Today, I've only got a chance to talk to two of those schools, and one of them is Bilbra College, where Isla here will explain a little bit more about what's going on here. So, what have you been studying, Isla? So, we're looking at the impact of pedestrianisation on air and noise pollution, specifically in nice. Nottingham, because that's where our college is located. And we're also looking at how deprivation can be impacted by air and noise pollution or like how they kind of impact each other and cause each other. So over here we've got, we're collecting some data for our own use. So we've got, if you'd like to put a sticker on where you think the government policy is on, like is, do you think a lot of action has been taken, a lot of progress is being made on air and noise pollution or do you think okay. it's a lot lesser? Oh, let me have a look. I've got no <laughs> nails. I am a nail biter. I'm such a nail biter. Okay. So, what is it? On this side, yes, yes, good progress good is being made on no or very little. Oh, what do we think? Do we think mm, made on tackling noise? It depends where you are. Yeah, but I'm I think like about... as, a, as a general thing. Yeah, we maybe, to do maybe an average. Like here? Yeah. I'm going to go there. Yeah. So, here we've got our equipment we've been using to do our um, kind of data collection. We're quite early on in the process just because of some issues with getting the equipment. But this is a handheld. Air, and, um, air pollution monitor. That is brilliant. Okay. So that was made for us by King's College London. And what does it detect? So if you look at there's the gaps here at the back where yeah. the air gets pushed passed through, and it'll detect particulate matter and nitrous oxides. Okay, which so that's pollutants. these gaps here. Yeah. 
and then it's got a GPS module so we can geolocate our data because we're really interested in geography. We're a geography like route. And so, so this that. is one device, and do you move that device around, or have you yeah. got multiple parts? Well, we've got a fixed station at our college, which is where we're collecting data to do with, you know, specifically where our college is and how the air pollution is there. But we've got we've been taking that round Nottingham city centre to see what it's like there. And we've also got a handheld uh, sound level meter, so we can measure noise pollution as well because we think that's quite important. And so I can measure the sound, right? Yeah. Do you want to have a bit of a shout in it? <laughs> right. <laughs> Let's see, so this, this measures sound level, right? Yeah. So if I speak like this, you can see it going up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, you can. And you can hold this against traffic yeah. and things like that and just see what the sound level yeah. is like. Brilliant. And then we've also been asking people to indicate on the map where they think air pollution is best and worst and noise pollution in Nottingham by like explaining to them a bit about like what Nottingham's like because a lot of people haven't been before. But and then if you indicate them on there, you can see where it is best and worst. And we've got the answers as well here. Absolutely. Isla, thank you so much for taking the time out. I know it's super busy yeah. here, but I have to go and speak to another group. Thank you so thank much you. and keep up the great Thanks. work. Thank you. And this is Shimon from North Fleet Technology College. Yeah. So what is your project? What's been going on? Our project is about the biodiversity in London. As we all know, London is a polluted place, yeah. obviously. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to investigate how humans and animals can live in harmony in London in such a polluted place. Got so you. what we've done is we've taken a nature reserve that we had in our, in our fields, yeah. which was in derelict. The houses nearby were thrown their rubbish into it and it was all rubbish. It was just disgusting. It was gone, yeah. It was gone. So what we did two and a half years ago, we came in and we thought we've got to, we've got to change this. So we put all the rubbish into the bins and we started tidying up. The first thing we did was we started putting trees in. So what we did, we got received hundreds and hundreds of trees, which we put around the fence. And then we decided to take on another project, which was the bees that we have here. Right. And these this bees. This is great. This yeah. is fantastic. And these bees that we've got, uh, received are helping us to po pollinate our field, create more flora, invite more uh, fauna in. And our fauna, we have a couple foxes in there, millions. Yes. We've got loads of squirrels, absolute tons. <laughs> we've got tons of birds as well. Butterflies, insects, we've got everything. Yeah. And is this a live camera of what's going on? Yes, so this is actually a recorded, but we have a live. Uh, this, we can just investigate what's going on. For example, last week we saw some foxes in there as well. So foxes playing in the grass, digging a hole underneath our fence, trying to get at us. I'm like, Brilliant. And then well, whilst they're doing, with the bees, obviously bees make honey, right? Yeah. And then humans like honey. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to take that honey and then sell it for profit so that what we can do is reach out to other primary schools and then fund their climate change projects. So which I think is brilliant. Yeah. This is absolutely brilliant. You can't quite rightly think it's brilliant because it, it absolutely is. And it goes to show what can be done when you sort of put your mind yeah. to it and get involved. Oh my gosh, this is fantastic. Thank you so much. Roma, it's back to you. I'm so impressed by those young scientists. And now I'm joined by someone with just slightly more experience, Gareth Veal. Welcome. Hi there. Anyone who knows about cancer treatments knows how tough chemotherapy can be, especially for children. Can you tell us a little bit about how difficult childhood cancer is in terms of scale? What, what is the scale of issue we're dealing with here? So in, in terms of metrics, there are around 1,800 children in the UK who are diagnosed with cancer each year. So that equates to around five patients a day. Wow. In terms of the impact on families, um, it's really hard. I think unless you've actually been in that situation where a child is diagnosed with cancer, I think that's incredibly difficult to be able to explain. I know from many years of doing clinical research, it's incredible how positive these families you know, stay. We, we carry out clinical trials, we carry out some research. The, the research we're talking about here down in London this week is very much a research project where the patients benefit. But actually we do a lot of research projects where it relies on the altruism of the families. So basically they're kind of like wanting to be involved in research, even if it doesn't help their child, for potentially for future children. So the positivity of the families just always amazes me. It's always um, very inspiring. Yeah, I can't imagine that that's, <laughs> it must be one of the worst things that you absolutely have to deal with in imagine, your life. Yeah, so, 
Um, when you're treating childhood cancers, you know, I mean, chemotherapy is tough for adults. Can you tell me a bit about the effect it has on younger bodies? Yeah, so I, th I think chemotherapy is challenging for any patient. Mm -hmm. um, at the end of the day, you're targeting your own cells. There's a subpopulation of your cells where there is this uncontrolled cell division. So most of the drugs, or certainly the well-established drugs, they're very much designed to target cell division or DNA replication. So that's obviously going to hit your host cells. There's going to be side yeah, effects. Because all cells do that, isn't Absolutely. it? Absolutely. Yeah, so so yeah. we know that the classic side effects of chemotherapy, like the hair loss, mm -hmm. affects your bone marrow because you're creating you know, hundreds of thousands of blood cells each day. They're the kind of acute effects, but after your chemotherapy, those effects will, you know, the hair will grow back, etc. Some of the more serious side effects, and this particularly is the case with children with well-established drugs, things like um, kidney toxicity, um, so damage to the kidneys. In very young children, sometimes hearing loss, effects on fertility. These are more long-term effects, which are then clearly going to affect the quality of life of the patient and, and more in the long term. Yeah, so a really, really tough problem to deal Absolutely. with. And I'm glad that some people like you are trying to improve that situation. Um, could you explain a little bit about how that can be improved and what is the work that you're doing? So the work that we do, we essentially look at kind of personalising the treatment in these um, patients. So one of the reasons why it's particularly challenging in children is because if you think in the paediatric space, we're going to be dealing with babies from the first, literally the first days or weeks of life through to teenagers, 15, 16 year old teenagers. Clearly, we're going to need to dose patients differently. They're going to handle drugs differently, etc. In adults, it's a little bit more homogenous. Also in adults, there are more, some of the newer drugs, the targeted drugs are a bit kinder, a bit fewer side effects. The, the more well-established drugs that are used to treat um, children with cancer, as I say, they generally target cell division, DNA replication. So there are some of these you know, quite severe side effects that are going to affect um, those children um, throughout their life. So we essentially look at following a standard dose of drug in patients. What does that mean in terms of drug exposure? And the best way to kind of explain that, I guess, is a therapeutic drug monitoring approach. If we had patients being treated, maybe there's a baby being treated at Great Ormond Street, there might be a baby being treated in Birmingham Children's Hospital, and there may be a baby being treated in um, Newcastle Hospital. Those babies are all very similar in terms of the physical size. They may be receiving the same chemotherapy for the same tumour type. But actually, following a standard dose of chemotherapy, one of those children may have a very low exposure to the drug. And when I talk about exposure, I mean the concentration of drug that's actually in the bloodstream, okay. because that's how the drug gets around the body to the tumour cells. So that's about how much the child is actually absorbing into their so bloodstream, yeah, so what's effective. Yeah. So it's to yeah. do with absorption, it's to do with the rate of metabolism and, and, and clearance of the drug. And in, especially in very young children, this varies a lot because, example, your kidneys are still developing in a very young child, your liver enzymes are you know, at different levels. So um, a second patient may have the kind of right exposure, by chance from the dose that's given. And then a third patient may have a much higher drug exposure and those patients are potentially more likely to get toxicity. So what we want, it's a bit like a kind of Goldilocks thing. You want that just right, not too much, not too little, because we know that if you've got too low an exposure, you're less likely to respond or you're more likely to relapse. And we know that if you get too high an exposure, you're more likely to have some of these more severe side effects. So in the UK, there are around, I think it's estimated over 40,000 childhood cancer survivors mm -hmm. over, I think between 75 and 80 percent of children now who are diagnosed with cancer will survive their treatment, but around two thirds of those children will have um, kind of side effects that are going to affect their quality of life. So the the project that we have, the therapeutic drug monitoring, we already do it as a national program. In terms of the project that we have and that we're we're showcasing at the um, at the exhibit this week, it's a link with um, a group of chemical engineers at the UCL and a, a spin out company called Vicinta. So we're kind of marrying together our medical science um, experience and research experience with their chemical engineering experience. And the idea is to have a, a kind of a hardware device which would be available at point of care, so within the hospitals. At the moment, in order to do the dose adjustments in patients, samples have to be sent to our lab in Newcastle at Newcastle University. Right. To make it much more accessible, what we would like is to have this kind of hardware available at point of care on a hospital ward so that a doctor or a nurse can use it. And what that device is doing is measuring the child's response to the drug, like, like you mentioned. So in our um, the research laboratory at Newcastle University, we have very large, expensive machines. The majority of the drugs are analysed by a technique called liquid chromatography mass spectrometry. 
The machine um, that is being developed by UCL, by the engineers, is very similar approach in terms of chromatography. It uses an old-fashioned thin layer chromatography, but will give the required level of, level of sensitivity for measuring the drugs accurately in the samples. So what does the machine actually do once you've taken a blood sample? So the new machine will work with ideally a very limited volume of blood. With current practice, we will analyze normally one to two millilitres of blood. The new machine will work with a drop of blood, which could be taken from a finger prick or in a baby from a heel prick, and will basically be loaded onto the machine, and then it will use the chromatography techniques to allow the, um, the drug levels to be um, quantified. Did you ever think that your career would be so rewarding? Um, no, it's, Maybe not, you it's did, not, something I ever, not something I ever really thought about, but you're absolutely right. In terms of job satisfaction, I mean, I work with a great team of people up in Newcastle, but the work that we do, we do a lot of work looking at development of new drugs, as well as this paediatric research programme. So I think we know that the vast majority of work we do is helping patients, whether that's adult patients or in this case, in children with cancer. So it's, it's absolutely rewarding. And the other, the other big thing is it, it just makes you realise, it puts things in perspective. You know, we're, we're analysing clinical samples from babies who are days old being treated for cancer. And it just makes your kind of any problems you have just pale into insignificance. Definitely. Um, but yeah, like I said before, again, I'm so glad that you and your team do the work that you do. It's been really inspiring talking Thank to you. you. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Now we are going to see chromatography in action with Fran, who should be back in the main hall. Are you there, Fran? Hi, yes, Roma, I have found the sprout. And I'm also joined by Professor Stefan Gooding from UCL. So, hello, Stefan. Hey, how are you doing? What's going on with the sprout? Well, actually, uh, we are testing the population. We want to find out who likes Brussels sprouts and we want to tell you why you like Brussels sprouts and why you don't like it. So, this is a test to easily find that out. Let's start with this one first. Okay, okay. And you mean so real Brussels sprouts, on your tongue. Not, not Matt here? Yeah, just <laughs> put it on your tongue and see what the sensation will tell okay. you. Okay. Uh -uh. You like this? What do you taste? Paper. Well, that's very good because it was just a control. This was just a small test. <laughs> now <laughs> that we go. The wrong answer. <laughs> no, 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 no. Now we go with the real test and we'll find out. Oh, okay, okay. So now, actually, there are people that taste nothing, just like with the filter paper, and others have a strong sensation. We'll find out. Let's give Let's it a go. go. Okay. Oh, that is that is disgusting. Like, what what is on that? So. On this, chem on this strip is actually a chemical that causes a bitterness in Brussels sprout. It's called PTC. And actually many people here on the stall had no sensation whatsoever. It's just that your taste buds are extremely sensitive to this chemical. So when it comes in, they lock in place and they fire a very strong sensation. So not everyone can taste that? Not everyone can taste and it. And that's why I don't like Brussels sprouts. Exactly. No offense. But actually, it also just illustrates how it's important to um, measure drug levels because not every person responds the same way to their medication. So as very much respond to this differently to this chemical, people respond differently to the medication due to distribution, metabolism and clearance. And we need to measure this. And we found a very simple way of measuring drug levels using this principle of color separation chromatography. Absolutely. So what you can see here is um, a black ink and how it's being um, traveling up when, it, when you dip it in water. And this is because different components of the black ink, uh, they travel at different speeds across the paper. And we can do something very similar to separate the drug from the blood, because if we tune this well, our drug will be somewhere in the middle and everything else will be either ahead or below. And using some tricks, we can actually use this to determine exactly the amount of drug in your blood in a very simple Brilliant. way. Brilliant. So using chromatography, you can know how much drug has actually got to the patient. But gosh, it's beautiful, isn't there? And there's lots of stuff going on over yeah, there. Yeah, exactly. Like chromatography is not only fun, um, uh, to, to, it's not only very accurate to measure drug levels, it can be very much fun uh, and you can do beautiful art. So I send you over to Mamta's now and you should do some stuff with her. Uh, thank you so Hi. much. Oh, look at this. Mamta's, this looks amazing. Hi. Nice to meet you. What is going on here? Well, I'd say this is the most colourful corner of the entire exhibition. It absolutely <laughs> is. We are trying uh, chromatography. Of course. And so we've got three different exciting things you can do with your chromatography papers. Yeah. We're actually looking at colour separation. So that's what chromatography is. And we're doing it with felt tip pens, mm -hmm. some coffee filter paper. So this is something that anyone can do at home absolutely. as well. Absolutely. And then you can actually turn it into a flower, a butterfly, or a keyring. 
And uh, what's really exciting is every single one. It's like it's so different, and it's like so magical and yes, brilliant. Go, right? Oh, well, this is fantastic. <laughs> so you you put the pens on, yeah. you put a little bit of water. It separates yeah. into the different colours. You know what's amazing about this? Okay, this was one line with a black felt tip pen. And like, look at how many colours you get from a black that pen. That is great. Okay, give me, give me a go. Give me right, a go, so Montaz. You're going to take your filter paper. Yeah, got it, and got it. And what we want to do, because we're going to look at colour separation, we want to leave some white gaps in there. Understood. And we want to leave the centre point empty as well. Yeah. And then you've got your felt tip pens. Yeah, okay. It's only worked with water based pens, not permanent. So, of course, and I just draw tip. any pattern. Yeah, the great thing is you could write a secret message, you could write words, patterns, no one's going to know. Right. <laughs> when you put it in the water, it all separate. Right, I'm just going to do a <laughs> line, I think. Um, Absolutely, a line can be very magical. A curly line, squiggly line. <laughs> around like this. I'm just going to do one colour actually. Yeah, I'm going to okay. do it nice let's and... Say this was black, so let's see what happens with the purple. And I put it in the water? Yes. So what you want to do is you only want to put the uh, white section in the water. Okay. You don't want the whole thing to drop in. So okay. I just dip so it, it in. So it a bit more into a cone shape so it's easier like to this. actually sit in there. That's right. And then just dip rest it in. in. Just rest it to the corner. Like this? To the edge. So what I normally say is, is rest one. it initially and then oh, it will yeah. just start oh, to stick in there right. and you just wait. <laughs> we don't need to fall over. Oh, yeah, yeah. So we're just going to rest it there and we'll wait and watch for the magic to happen. It takes a few minutes. Yeah. You only got the one colour so we'll just see how that actually travels up. And, and you can see, see the some water pink, rising. Some yeah. little pinks coming out of there. So we can already see that. It's totally already working. You can see it coming up. It's a bit wetter than, you know, we would have liked. Oh, that is fantastic. And it's using this method that you've made all of these beautiful things here. Yeah. Oh, Montaz, <laughs> this is, it's such a beautiful way to look at chromatography. That is such an important tool when it comes to science. Roma, it's back to you. Oh, let's go. Now, last year, the UK recorded its highest ever temperature of 40.3 degrees Celsius. And on the news recently, we've seen devastating floods, droughts and wildfires worldwide. My next guest is Hannah Cloak, a specialist in extreme weather and professor of hydrology at the University of Reading. She has appeared on TV, including in the Panorama episode, Wild Weather, Our World Under Threat. And she was the subject of the Life Scientific on Radio 4 in 2021. Welcome, Hannah. It's lovely to be here. When did you first discover your fascination with water and geography? I wonder if I was actually just born into water because, you know, when I was a little girl, I was just fascinated by it. And we used to go on holiday to Devon to see my grandparents every summer. And I just used to throw myself into the sea, and, you know, go paddling in Dartmoor rivers and just spent hours and hours in the water. So I think it was there from when I was very, very small. I'm sure that my my mum and dad influenced me as well. That's amazing. I, lo I love that. Um, but then water can also be quite a devastating force on the world. So could you talk a little bit about that and, you know, the research that you do now? So I do love water. I love the sound of rain. I love flinging myself into rivers. But I'm very aware that it, you know, these things can turn into monsters. So heavy rainfall, um, rivers can turn floody, and they will absolutely devastate communities. So it's it's really interesting being very um, fascinated by water and how it moves around the planet, but yet being very aware of how dangerous it can be. And that's really why I do what I do. So mm. I'm interested in flood forecasting, um, warning people, making sure people can get out of the way of dangerous floods. Mm. Now, it seems like some scientists perhaps are a bit reluctant to kind of pinpoint the cause of some of these extreme weather events as being because of the climate crisis. Like, what's your response to that? Yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting question because mm. it's always flooded. So it's, it's flooded since before humans existed. Um, and we've always had heat waves and there's always been forest fires. So it would be wrong to say that every forest fire is uh, caused by climate change. What it does is it makes it more likely. Mm -hmm. um, so we see more of them. Sometimes they're more frequent. Sometimes they're more intense. So our floods can cover more land. They can be more violent. Um, because of the fingerprints of climate change. So it's really important to distinguish that because we can't just go around saying, oh, this flood is definitely because of climate change, but we can say 
uh, that it's more likely because of climate change and the fingerprints of climate change are there, which means that we need to take it seriously. So it's almost like there's the, the effect that we're having on the planet is to make things a little bit more riskier in, in this sort of natural disaster regard. Yeah, that's exactly it. Yeah. The, the risk changes mm. that, that factor of it's going to happen more often, it's going to be worse. Yeah. And how good are we <clears throat> and how good are we at predicting, you know, the next flood or the next extreme event like that? We've got some really good models now. So we have huge computer models of the Earth system that can put together how the atmosphere moves around, and what's happening on the land surface and in our rivers. And we're actually pretty good now at saying whether a natural hazard like a fire or a heat wave or a flood is going to happen even sometimes two or three weeks ahead. So is, and is that enough? Is two or three weeks ahead, I guess, enough to respond to that adequately? So it depends what you're trying to do. Yeah. So if you're trying to get people out of the way, mm. then you need at least a week sometimes to prepare all of that stuff in advance. Um, we only tend to hear about things a day in advance. Somebody says, you know, actually tomorrow it's going to rain really hard. You need to, you know, get mm. out of your house. But behind the scenes, people are moving around, putting equipment in the right place, yeah. going on alert. And... With this kind of, I guess in the longer term, if I'm, you know, from my perspective as a structural engineer, I've been involved in, you know, urban planning and looking at cities and so on. How can we use the kind of modeling that you do to maybe better design where human beings decide to settle down? Yeah, humans have a tendency to live in very dangerous places. <laughs> we like well, water, right? We, we want to live next to rivers. Pretty. It's really pretty <laughs> living next to the river. Um, and, you know, it's really functional. In London, it's, you know, a really nice place to live. People want to live there. It's really expensive. Um, but it can be very, very dangerous indeed. So we have this legacy of people living in really, really dangerous mm -hmm. places. Um, but we can use the same types of model that we use when we're forecasting whether a flood is coming next week, we can use that to work out what, what the risk is of any types of floods coming along. We can say, you know, these zones are dangerous zones, do not build here, perhaps even move people out of the way. Uh, and then these places, you know, there is still some risk, so you need to adapt your homes or your businesses. And what kind of time skills are you able to make these predictions on now? So when we're thinking about uh, an upcoming flood, so it's going to flood tomorrow or next week, we, we can say with some confidence whether that flood is going to happen. But when we look long term and we think about our changing climate, mm -hmm. we can see how likely those types of floods are to happen in the future. And some of the things we're most worried about actually are flash floods. Those ones that are really difficult to predict in the short term. And, you know, sometimes they come along in an hour or something. A big thunderstorm happens and it sweeps through the streets or, or along a river. Um, but we know that they are getting more likely in the future. And, and a, a warming climate means we're, we're holding more water in the atmosphere, heavier rainfall, more intense rainfall, more flash floods. What about the scene kind of more globally? We've, I guess we've talked a little bit more specifically at the UK, perhaps. What, what's happening on the worldwide basis with flood prediction? Some of the most vulnerable places in the world are desperately in need of much better flood forecasting and warning systems. Um, a lot of those places, you know, they don't have enough funding to really get to grips with some of these um, global models. Yeah. So it's about working together with partners, perhaps in Mozambique and Bangladesh, yeah. places that are very filled with floods often. And, and a lot of people die every year from these types of floods. So the more that we can um, support those countries and pro provide kind of the infrastructure uh, and work together with them to help them uh, get the warnings to the people so they can get out of the way of those floods, the better. Yeah, seems like it's it's one of those things where, you know, the more we come together, the better our responses can be and so on. So um, qu quite a big challenge. <laughs> it's a big, a big job. Challenge. It yeah. is a big job. The world is a very big place. Yeah. Um, and we do have global models and they do provide like flood forecasts and floods, um, heat wave forecasts. But actually getting that message to the people on the ground, mm -hmm. that's really, really tough. So you can only really do that at the local level. So, you're, you know, you're moving from global, um, you know, environmental models to actually psychology at the local level. And that's a big chain of chain of events. Completely. Um, so now I'm going to ask you a completely different question, which is poetry. Apparently, I've heard <laughs> that you've written some poetry. There's something about the brain, isn't there, doing arts and science together? I mean, is, is that something you quite enjoy? 
Yeah, I think uh, as a scientist, I was a bit wary about it, thinking mm. that's, that's a bit unscientific. Let's not do that. <laughs> you know, people will laugh at me. But actually opening up that different way of thinking um, actually generates new ideas. And you actually start to think in a different way as well and communicate in a different way. Um, so I work with now with artists, uh, musicians uh, across the board, um, do a lot of work with uh, museums. And it's brought a lot, a much richer way of communicating things like flood risk. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like, I mean, I know this, but, you know, arts and sciences, if we need to talk to each other, then we can learn new things from each other, which which is brilliant. Yeah, and not be frightened, not be not frightened be fr to do no, so. No, 100%. Yeah. Um, so that's that's really great. And is there something that you would be devastated to lose if it got swept away in a flood? It's really important, actually, to focus on that when you're trying to communicate to people whether they're at flood risk and what's actually going to happen to them. Mm. Because if they just think about, like, how much rain is falling or how high the river is, it means nothing to them. But if you pick something that's really precious to someone, so for me, that's my grandmother's music box. You know, she gave it to me. Sadly, she's passed away. Uh, it, it means a lot from my childhood and it sits on my shelf and I always imagine, you know, how would I feel if that got swept away in a flood? And to me, that's the real meaning of being at flood risk. Yeah. And I guess it's a, it's a way to, to explain the risk to other people, like you said, that, you know, it might feel like a very distant yeah, thing. and they have to imagine it. So they have mm. to be able to imagine those floodwaters in the house yeah. and putting their possessions at risk, perhaps putting their family at risk. Mm. And you need to help that imagination along. So those types of precious objects are really helpful to do that. Mm. Just to change scales a little bit again, but the Wellcome Trust, which some of our viewers may be familiar with, has recently talk, started talking about how climate change is a health crisis. You know, what are your thoughts on that? There are so many links between climate and health. I, I don't think I could cover them all now, <laughs> but I'll pick a couple. Um, I mean, last summer we saw absolutely intense heat uh, in the city. We went over that 40 degree barrier and it was terrifying. And it meant, you know, thousands of people died. Um, and that, you know, that's pretty severe. And that's in the UK. We're not even thinking about places on the planet where it's absolutely inhospitable to live. So heat is a giant killer. It's a silent killer as well. Mm -hmm. So we, we don't, it's not like a roaring flood water coming through your house. It, you know, it really picks the vulnerable people as well. Um, so that, that's an obvious example of where climate and health are, are so intricately linked. Thank you so much for chatting to me. It's been fascinating to hear about really what's a major problem worldwide, but also, you know, like you said, the psychology of the family or the person or the community that then has to respond to that on a local level. So I really appreciate your time. Now, everyone knows about 3D movies and gaming, but not all of you will have experienced 3D sound. And I don't just mean stereo or surround sound, I mean audio recorded with ears in the same way we experience sound in real life. Hello again, I'm here with the audio experience design team and Kat Paul from Imperial College London, and I'm all ears to find out what you have been doing. So Kat, what is this all about? So essentially we want to make sound, sound immersive. And so right. when we're listening in the real world, like me standing next to you, um, you use your two ears together. And so we, if you have a sound that's coming to the right of you, it'll be louder in your right ear compared to your left ear. Yeah. It'll also arrive at this ear quicker than this ear. But what do you do when sounds are coming in this plane? So yeah. it's always going to be the same. This is when we use the shape of our ears and sort of the head and our torso to really help us figure out where sounds are coming from. Because if a sound is coming from below, it will bounce around slightly differently than if a sound is coming from above. Right. But we don't have the same head and the same ear shape. And so if we wanted to make a really immersive spatial sound scene for you, then we want to be able to replicate how sound bounces around your individual body. So the way that we do that is we take a 3D scan of your head and your shoulders, and then we simulate with some physics models how the sound bounces around for you in every single position. So then we can create a sort of sonic fingerprint for you, and then we can apply that to any sound that we record and say what position it's coming from. That is brilliant. Now, I am a sucker for an immersive experience, and you're telling me that you can scan my ear so then I can get an audio experience that is not only immersive, but is super personalized for me. Yeah, exactly. Let's do it, Kat. I am on board. <laughs> where do I need to go? What do I need to do? Well, you've got to come around the side into this booth, and this is where we do the ear scanning. Right. And I sit on this stool, right? Yes, so if you come sit on this stool, 
and so okay. I will just set up the scanner. Uh, this is the scanner that we use, and it uses a flashing light, and so if we present the flashing light, hopefully you can see my hand on the screen. Well, that's great, yeah. So we're going to do exactly the same for your ear. So if I can get you to face forwards, yeah. and then I will come round. And if you can close your eyes, and I'm just going to move the scanner around your head and build a 3D model. OK. Eyes are closed. I'm ready. There we go. So yeah, as I move it around, it tracks where it's scanned, and then I can angle the light, and then we can get a good picture of your ear. OK, so you're just moving it across exactly. my ear now. And so the light shines in every sort of crook and crevice, and it sort of builds up a 3D model oh gosh. of your ear. Every crook and crevice. Yep. <laughs> oh, no. And so I'm going to stop Brilliant. now. OK. And can and I then, move? Yeah, now you can move, and okay. now it's all done. So. And is this it processing the exactly. data? Exactly. It's processing the data. It's taking all the sort of, it builds little points. And then after that, it meshes it together into a nice 3D model that then we can either look at, or we can print it out on a 3D printer if you really wanted to. So. Amazing. Oh, okay, let's go and have a look. Let's, oh, I'm a bit nervous. Oh. <laughs> this is my ear. Like, I have never seen it. And it is, oh my gosh, the details and like the ear piercing. You can see so much. I've never, it's a part of your body that you just never see. No, uh, you never get to see it yourself because it's on the side of your head. Oh my word. That is absolutely fascinating. And you use this to, I suppose, reverse engineer the immersive experience to make it personalized. Yeah, exactly. We can just simulate how the sound bounces around in your ear and then create that fingerprint for you. That is brilliant. Roma, I do hope you are listening to all of that because no doubt I will test you later. But for now, it's back to you. Oh, Fran, I don't like having tests, um, but I am thrilled to have a psychoacoustic specialist, Lorenzo Piccinali, here to tell us a little bit more about what Fran just did. Lorenzo, welcome. It's great to have you here. Thank you very much. What is 3D sound? Uh, 3D sound or immersive sound is effectively what we experience in everyday life. Mm -hmm. So you walk on the street and you hear sounds that come from different positions at different distances in different directions, they move differently. And all these attributes about the spatial nature of sounds or the position and etc. is what we generally refer to as 3D sound or immersive sound. Now normally with these two expressions we refer to us simulating this in a virtual environment. An idea could be when you go to the cinema and you listen to this surround sound, Dolby surround, and there you have a lot of different loudspeakers around you that reproduce sound and you perceive the sound coming from different directions. So that is the concept. But you need lots of speakers in order to well, in achieve that, case, that so yes. far? Yes, so I would say that the majority of the techniques, also at home, you might have multiple loudspeakers. Yeah. Now, what we are trying to do is, uh, uh, starting from the point that we actually hear everything from two ears, mm -hmm. why don't we go directly to the two ears, maybe with a pair of headphones, and try to trick your brain to believe that there is something in a position where there is not. Franz just had her head scanned. Yes. What, what's, why did she do that and what's going to happen next? Now, in order to, to run this simulation and to really trick people to believe that there are sounds where they're not, we need to take into account certain morphological features of our ear and head. So our head, our pinna, which is this part of the ear, but also the shoulders, the fact that, for example, I don't have much hair, uh, but I have beard. All these things are going to influence the way uh, that sound is modified by these features and the way my brain uh, understands where sound is coming from. So you and me will hear things quite differently. Yes, definitely. Of, of, of this stuff. Yeah, I, I have a very big head because I'm very intelligent, a lot of you brain are. to be you kept are. inside. <laughs> and therefore I will have bigger differences in terms of, for example, intensity in between the two ears. So we scan the ear, we scan the head, and then we use certain mathematical methods in order to find out how from a given position in space, the sound is modified up to the entrance of your ear canal. And eventually, uh, we, well, even now we are starting training uh, neural network models, so artificial intelligence, in order to be able to predict what is someone's own signature from less and less data. Okay. Eventually it could just be a picture, or even it could just be some data that you input in the, in the device. So you're trying to make it easier to basically figure out that person's individual characteristics, to give them the sound um, based on 
all this data that you're collecting. Exactly. Yeah. To make it much easier than it is at the moment and that we can do at the moment. So I've got some headphones here. Um, should, I, should I stick them on? Is that the you plan? You should definitely yeah? try. Okay, let's this, have a go. So this is just some of the demonstrations that we use, yeah. which are actually available for who visits our stand. And they are available also online. Yeah. Headphones are important because we need the left signal to get to your left ear and the right signal to go to your right ear, which doesn't happen with a normal pair of loudspeakers. If you want to listen along, pop your headphones in and you'll be able to hear what I am about to hear now. Good morning. I'm here in front of you. Or maybe I'm close to your right ear. Maybe I'm here. Or here. Or again, I could be here. Or here. Or here. Okay, that's weird. <laughs> the other side. Or back in front of you. Um, <laughs> that was a particularly strange experience because yeah. I was listening to your voice. So my voice whispering kind and talking Kind of moving, around. but so it was like you were on different sides of me, yeah. but also closer and farther away. Yes. Um, but clearly I could see you there, so my brain was a little bit confused. Yeah, that, that is what lightly. often happens. <laughs> uh, well, not unfortunately, but sight often takes over. This is why it's often difficult to, to have a clear sound image that is frontal. When people experience this, they often hear sources on the back because mm. they can't clearly see something on the front, so they believe that is on the back. Yeah. Closing your eyes up helps in these cases. Oh, yeah, maybe. It's a <laughs> bit disconcerting. Um, so is this going to be a big feature of the entertainment industry? Well, it, it already is to a certain extent. I mean, Apple's latest products, their, their ear pods, they already have some of this technology. Now, we don't know exactly what they do, uh, but uh, they do something in this direction. And it is possible that now with Dolby Atmos and all these new things, both from the, from the audiovisual and, and the music industry, will allow more of this technology to be available. It's also true, when I started this research in this field 20 years ago, headphones were not as widely used as now. If you go on the tube, more than half of the people are going to have a pair of headphones. I had a student who had a pair of headphones that was in, even connected to something. It was just a fashion statement. <laughs> so people have headphones. And if you have headphones, then we can do this. So hopefully they're going to become much more, uh, it's going to become a little bit much more mainstream mm. and more integrated, for example, with video game experiences and, and other things. And yeah. it might become available soon. That's very exciting. And what about outside of entertainment? Yeah, outside of entertainment, this is actually the area where we have done more work. So applying this uh, technology to create impact in, let's say, non-leisure activities. So we have used these, for example, for uh, developing auditory displays for blind people. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, but more recently, we have worked a lot with hearing aid companies. And actually, one of the other projects, the other project that we are showing here at the Royal Society is uh, called and uh, which stands for both ears. And it involves the development of uh, a, a series of video games, a virtual reality video games, where we employ this technique. What we're trying to do is to replicate what happens in real life scenarios, specifically in difficult situations where you have, for example, multiple talkers and a target that you want to listen to. And we are uh, planning to use these games for uh, children and teenagers that had um, a bilateral cochlear implant. Mm. Um, so when you have these sort of digital ears that are surgically implanted, you have both ears. The two ears might be rather mismatched for many reasons. So not only maybe one ear is louder than the other, but you might also have a different pitch and slightly different timbre. So often the brain is not really able to, to, to fuse the two together. And so we are using a series of games that can be performed only by using both ears at the same time to help them train to use the two implants and to remap their auditory system so that the brain is able to use these altered cues more successfully. I always love a piece of engineering or science that um, has entertainment value, but also medical applications. So um, thank you so much for joining me, Lorenzo. It's been great to hear about your research. Okay, thank you very much. Um, now, we're going to take a short break. When we come back, Fran will be going on a special mission deep into the archives of the Royal Society to discover some of its treasures. In the meantime, have you ever wondered what your pet's whiskers are really for? If so, this video from the Royal Society and the BBC will provide the answer. I study whiskers because they're just the best. 
most mammals, they have whiskers. And what's exciting about them is that there's so much stuff that we don't know. I like to look at something that we see every day and then find out really cool and interesting things about them. Lots of people, when they hear about whiskers, they think immediately of cat whiskers. But actually, other animals have much better whiskers. They're more sensitive, they're bigger, they move more than cats' whiskers. Porcupine whiskers are just the longest whiskers I've seen. The one I've got back in the lab is about 45 centimetres long. And they move them almost continually. And then they kind of bump and move and vibrate around over the material that they're on. So you can really see that they're moving all the time. Hi, gorgeous. <laughs> It's very difficult to study the evolution of whiskers because hair isn't really preserved in the fossil record. So we have a look at this little hole here, which is called the infraorbital foramen, or whisker holes. And all the information from the whiskers, from those sensitive follicles, travel through that hole and into the brain. Humans are really quite unusual to not have whiskers, but we do still have these whisker holes where our whiskers would have been and also we even have some remnants of muscles similar to what we see in in animals with whiskers whiskers are very much like human fingertips lots of animals can move their whiskers and then some animals engage in what is called whisking so this is cyclic forwards and backward movements that the animals make with their whiskers and we might think of this as, as scanning so when we walk into a room we might be looking around everywhere trying to see all around us and that's what these guys are doing and the fastest whisking that i've seen has been in harvest mice which reach up to about 25 times per second, which is some of the fastest movements that mammals can make. The most sensitive whiskers are in aquatic mammals. Lots of seals will have kind of just under 2,000 nerve fibers surrounding all of those whiskers in the follicle. And their whiskers are so sensitive, they can do this amazing thing, which is called hydrodynamic sensing. So as a fish swims through the water, it leaves behind a wake, a trail of water movements, and the seals are able to detect this. And they use only their whiskers for this. These are porcupine whiskers, and you can see that they're arranged into a grid or whisker map. So you have rows and columns of whiskers, so they're very ordered. The same grid-like pattern can be seen in physical structures through the brain. And our neuroscientists love this because it means that they can actually tweak one whisker here, so a middle whisker, and they can follow it through the entire brain to see where that sensory signal goes. And each physical structure will light up in turn. In many animals, whiskers are their primary and most important sense. So it's very, very important not to trim them. They won't hurt them, but they'll suddenly remove a sense. So it'd be like if you blindfolded us and then put us in a room. And so we've got to feel around to work out where we are. And that is what these animals are doing all the time. We can see that when we look at rats and mice, that some of them will actually engage in a behavior called barbering. So this is when you have a dominant individual that will trim the whiskers, so bite off the whiskers of their family or other people that live in their box. And so when they do that, those individuals will become more submissive. So it establishes this hierarchy within the cage. Whiskers can inspire lots of new technology and innovations. Firstly, we could have a look at their shape. So the undulations of seal whiskers has inspired, for instance, turbine blades. So turbine blades can be extra aerodynamic because they have these amazing undulations or waves along them. These could also be applied to tidal energy as well. Then you have the fact that they are sensors. You can put these sensors onto robots. So then you can have tactile robots or whisker bots. And these could be really useful for something even like a robot hoover, but 
but also to make sure that robots can go into hazardous, dark or complex environments. These are the environments we need our robots to go into. So people don't really think about whiskers at all. Uh, you probably go home and look at your cat or your gerbil or your rabbit and you think, oh yeah, they're fluffy and have whiskers. But actually what we're doing is trying to understand, well, how do they work and how sensitive are they and what do they use them for? And I think that that's super interesting to find out. Welcome back. Now, I am grinning from ear to ear because we are in for a treat. We are about to head down into the Royal Society vaults, which is an absolute treasure trove of objects from the history of science. And to guide us through that maze is none other than the Royal Society archivist, Ginny Mills. Hello, Ginny. Hi, Fran. Nice to meet you. Really nice to meet you. So could you lead the way? You guide yeah, us there. I've got the key. Let's go downstairs. Brilliant. So come on, come on. Mind your head on this. It's a, it's a bit of a maze through here. Okay, so we're going through. Oh, in we come, round the corner. Now there's so many things in this vault. Apparently they have a penguin from Antarctica. They have a lock of Sir Isaac Newton's hair. Apparently they have a perpetual motion machine <laughs> and even a potato masher that belonged to none other than Ernest Rutherford. Though I am told that he did not use it to split the atom. That's Pretty right. sure that that wasn't uh, possible. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so in we go. Oh, look at that door. What? Oh, that yeah. is great, Jenny. We like to keep everything nice and secure. It's 350 years of science history, so you're going to keep it safe. <gasps> oh, my word. In we go. Oh, my gosh. So many things. Where are we? <gasps> Okay. Oh my, oh, and you've got some stuff out for us. Yeah, absolutely. So you've got some things here to have a look at. And um, the first thing I've got out for you was um, inspired actually by one of the exhibitors here at the exhibition. So you may have seen the Sensing Volcanoes um, absolutely, exhibit, yeah. where they're all about using all your senses to detect the signs of a volcanic eruption. So I thought, and um, yeah, what's interesting to me about that is actually they're also looking back at historical records to see what they can learn about previous eruptions and the signs from that. So I thought we'd look back at some historical records of um, volcanic eruptions. And this is yeah, probably the most famous volcano, mm -hmm. do you reckon? Krakatoa? It's pretty, it's pretty, pretty I think pretty everyone's famous. heard of Krakatoa, right? Because when it erupted famously in 1883, it uh, was the one of the biggest volcanic eruptions in history. Four times more powerful than the biggest ever nuclear device to be detonated. Gosh. So it was massive. It had a huge global effect and the Royal Society wanted to study that. So they've put together a committee, which a report, not only on the eruption of the volcano, but on the after effects. And it was one of the first examples of a citizen science project, mass observation. They put an advert in the paper asking for people to write in with the things that they'd observed in the aftermath. I did of, not know that. Yeah, I had no idea. So 1883, citizen science is going it's, strong. It's, yes. And this is the resulting report. So let's dive into that. Um, so here we go. Here is... <gash> A photo, well, photo, a, a engraving from a yes. photo of the early stages of the eruption of Krakatoa in 1883. Oh, my word. So, yeah. um, so this is in May, and then the big sort of, the massive eruption event happens in August 1883. And then the effects of that are felt around the world. Um, so obviously it's absolutely catastrophic, catastrophic event. 36,000 people lost their lives. Gosh. And we can see here, this is a chart... Um, so collected from data from meteorological stations and observatories around the world where they're seeing the after effects. So we've got here. Go on, I was going to point yeah. out actually because you're not wearing gloves and I know that oh, some people sure. think that you do have to wear gloves, but I know that it's actually better for the books not to wear the you're gloves. so isn't it? right, Fran, you're absolutely right. Uh, we're more, much more dexterous with our hands and more careful if we don't have big clunky gloves on, which yeah. might be dirty and as well. So. So yeah, we'll, we'll just be careful and have nice clean hands. Of course. So yeah, here we can see this is um, the um, passage of tidal waves that went round the world as a result oh, of the um, eruption. Um, and we can see here a map showing the places at which sounds of the explosion were heard. So that because they've got all these reports coming in from around the world, they know... Um, you know, what everyone was experiencing in the aftermath. And so we can see here is the sort of epicenter in Indonesia. And these are marks where the sounds were heard as far away as Australia. Wow. 
And this is 1883. This is, Absolutely. you know, to, to even be able to communicate for that yeah. distance is, is a huge feat. Yeah, so they were getting letters in and it was also early days of Telegraph, of course, so mass communication oh, coming in. So much like, to I see. I just want to really quickly show you as well. There's some beautiful illustrations in here. So it was obviously a really disastrous event, but way around the world in London, the after effects were actually quite beautiful. So we've got here some of the sunsets that was seen as a result of the particles from the volcano yes. traveling around the world. And they actually, this is one of the first um, observations of the jet stream because they realized this is how the particles from the volcano were being carried around the world globally. And then you get this amazing kind of diffraction of, of the light because of the particles in the atmosphere. Of course you do. So really disastrous events, some interesting science and also some beautiful artwork. Yeah, and you've got some other objects as well? We have, yeah, so I thought we go even further back right. into history um, and have a look here at one of the oldest items actually in the Royal Society's no way. collections. You so spoil us, Ginny. Yeah, it's a very little package here. Good thing, um, small yeah. packages. <laughs> All right. But here we go. So this is um, older than the Royal Society itself. So the Royal Society has been around since 1660. This little manuscript is a medieval almanac. What? You can see that. So the Royal Society got this in 1668, but by that time it was already like 250, 300 years old. Um, and we can see, so an almanac is basically like a calendar. And if we see, as we fold it out, it's got a lot of information packed in it. They were busy people. Yeah. <laughs> so, and then if I flip it over, you can see all kinds of information on the other oh. side as well. <laughs> so this is a sort of agricultural almanac. It tells you what different activities you should be doing in the different months of the year. So we've got sort of um, ploughing and planting seeds. And we've also got the signs of the zodiac on here. Oh, my word. Yeah. And you've got so, so, so many objects to show us. And I know you've got one more, but that is way upstairs. So, Roma, back to you, because Ginny and I, we have to go back up all those stairs. So, so Roma, I don't know, maybe tell them where they can look at more objects about this. But Ginny, guide the way. Let's, let's see if we can make it back upstairs. If you want to have a look at some of the amazing things in the Royal Society's archives, head over to the YouTube channel Objectivity. There are loads of really fascinating objects and other things that you can check out there. Fran, are you back yet? Oh, we have just made it back up to so even more objects here. Oh gosh, Ginny, what are we looking at here? Uh, so we've got here some original apparatus from the 1930s. And this was apparatus used by a fellow of the Royal Society called Elsie Widowson. A great woman. Absolutely, yeah. She was a pioneering nutritionist. Um, what she's best known for is um, her work on making sure people still had a healthy diet mm. during rationing in the Second World War. Absolutely. So she knew that people would be having to survive on less food because supplies had been disrupted. So she set about working out what food, the sort of the minimum amount you could survive on while still getting the nutrition that you needed. Brilliant work and so important. Absolutely, yeah. And um, she was willing to do some self-experimentation for that work as well. <laughs> of course she was. Yeah, so we can see um, a picture of her here um, mm -hmm. from a newspaper, actually her obituary, oh. um, where um, she's got these needles in her arms. So three or four different needles um, injecting different nutrients, calcium, iron, magnesium, um, and yeah, observing how the body takes them up. And, and regulates the amounts of those nutrients in the body. And are these those needles? These are the original needles, yeah, that she was using. Amazing. Yeah. Um, so we can see here it's on a plaster cast of an arm as well, and this is mm -hmm. a plaster cast taken from Elsie Widowson's <laughs> own arm. Yeah. You don't do things by halves, do you? Oh, like plaster not. cast yeah. of her arm and the actual needles. Oh yeah. my gosh, the stuff that you have here is absolutely incredible. Now, I am going to head back down to the archives because I haven't had enough of them. And so we're going to head back down there. I just hope that I can find my way back out. But for now, it's back to you, Rover. Yeah, and she's disappeared. Well, my next guest is very much here with us, and she is the absolutely incredible Jilly Forrester. She's an expert in animal behavior, especially language, and she runs a project called the Great Ape Challenge. Hi, Jilly, welcome. Hi, Roma, thank you so much for having me. I think we are gonna start with this amazing contraption. I'm obsessed with gears and cogs, but I even have tattoos of gears <laughs> on my arm. Um, so, so what is this? So. This is a puzzle that is actually part of a research project that looks at how we solve problems with our hands, not just us, but how we gained this capability over evolutionary time. So these puzzles have actually been used by 
gorillas, chimpanzees, and orangutans, and also us humans, also, you know, another great ape. Absolutely. And I think you have a nut for me, or Ooh, you've got something in store for me. Would you like to me? have a go, Roma? <laughs> I, think, I think I'm going to have to. Do you think you can beat our chimpanzee, gorilla, and orangutan's himes? But have they had a lot of practice? <laughs> you know, okay. they're All right, let's intuitive. have a go, let's have a go. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to tell you the objective. This, this is one of our puzzles here. Mm -hmm. I'm going to put this false nut, okay. in case you have an allergy, we don't want to no, you know, no, have any good. issues here, <laughs> in the top cog right there. Can you see that? Yep. All you have to do is find a way mm -hmm. to get this nut all the way through the box, okay. out the bottom of the box, yep. in your hand, as quickly as you can. Okay. Yeah? Okay. Does that sound good? Yeah. Do you think we should put a timer on? Um, yeah, let's do it. You ready? Yeah. You steady? Uh, yeah, three, two, one, and go. All right. Quick off the mark there. <laughs> Ooh, straight through the double cogs, down to the flat maze. She's moving pretty quickly that here. Elvis commentary. I don't know. I think, I think she's on par with some of our faster apes. She's right up the side. Oh my gosh, this is a sterling okay, that was 17 effort. seconds. I think that was That's at least, good. yeah, yeah. It was under 20. It, it was, was under 20, 20 seconds for sure. <laughs> that is amazing. That is... Um, that's actually quite a lot faster than many of our great ape cousins. Um, but I think you maybe had a, a little bit of, of a coincidental positive moment at the bottom there. I? I'm not sure if you saw that if you'd gone the other way with the cogs here, you actually oh, would, would have lost it in a trap and not been able oh, to yeah. extract the nut, which happens to many, many people often. And then you need to tilt the whole game sideways? Well, they lose it. And you know, if, oh, if you, so game over, <laughs> game over. Ding, ding. Game over. Yeah. Um, and the reason why we do this and have these different ways of solving the problem is that this puzzle actually is supposed to represent um, one of the components of our own human language. Okay, interesting. Right, so let us, should we put that back on the table? Sure. Then? And I'm, I've got lots of, lots and lots of <laughs> questions for you. Um, so you mentioned language, but this seems to be more of a kind of dexterity, spatial awareness type thing. So how do the two things relate? So it's a really good question. We don't think that we were always vocal language users. Um, so if we look back in our kind of prehistory, um, pre-linguistic time, there, there must have been behaviors that helped us gain our vocal capabilities. Um, and one of the things that we think was like a really good catalyst um, was solving problems with our hands. So using tools, making tools, preparing food, anything that requires you to put um, actions in the right order mm -hmm. to get the right result out requires you to have effectively what we call syntax in language. Mm. So in syntax for words, if you put the words in the right order, you get the correct meaning out. And if you don't, you get a bunch of gibberish. So there's a bit of logic involved in this. You're kind of saying that the logic that we use to solve problems with our hands is similar logic that we're now applying to, to uh, words. No, absolutely. Yeah. And in fact, if you're signing your language or speaking your language, it's the same bit of brain that's working. And we know from neuroscience studies that the bit of the brain that oversees our manual motor action behavior and, and our vocal behavior is actually highly overlapping. That's so fascinating. And, and this, this is the, I'm sorry, this is also true in our ape cousins. Well, this is why it's so interesting mm. to look at them because we're trying to look for answers about how we became upright, walking, talking, tool-using great apes. And because none of our ancient ancestors are alive today for us to ask, and we can't dig up cognition because it doesn't fossilize, one of the opportunities to investigate who we were and how we came mm -hmm. to be who we are today is to compare our behaviors to other apes. So if this does represent a syntax where you have to learn about how things work together. And the point of the box is, is that if you look at the different sections, there's a bit of the flat maze that you yeah. worked through. So that's kind of like a concrete noun. You always know where you are. You've got your finger on the nut. Yeah. And then yeah. you had cogs, which are kind of like verbs. You can not touch the nut, but you can move it through action. Mm -hmm. And then you had double cogs where you couldn't touch the nut you couldn't touch the cog that the nut was in, but you could touch the cog that moved the cog that the nut was in. So there's an indirect link. 
in some way. Right. So there's like this layer of abstraction where you have to understand how one thing modifies another, like an adjective modifies a noun. Mm. So if you don't understand those relationships, you can't solve the problem. And the goal was if we can create a physical syntax, mm -hmm. which is actually how we think <laughs> language might have started as gestures and motions that had these structures, if our great ape cousins can also solve those, then that might give us a clue as to how it originated for us. That's so fascinating. And then I understand that people have been trying to s teach um, our cousins to speak or to communicate since the 1980s. At so least, so what yeah. does that look like and how is that going? <laughs> Um, they weren't hugely successful, and I think a lot of the reason is that physiologically we're quite we're quite different. We stand on two feet. It changed the way our our spines are orientated and the the way our necks sit on our spines, and that changed the whole kind of morphology of the mouth and the throat. And we can't really they can't really make the same sounds that we can. Um, but likewise, I think it always made me think: Why are we teaching them our language instead of? learning how they're communicating, because that would be yeah. more interesting for us to understand who we are as humans today. And what's the ultimate goal of your research? So there are, I mean, there are several. One is that we are also looking at children using these sorts of tools, these sorts of games and puzzles, because we know that the kinds of behaviors, like those manual dexterity is exactly as you were saying, um, they come first in development and language follows yeah. after. I was thinking about my toddler, like she very much like explored things with her hands, well, and mouth, mm. um, way before she ever started using language. Exactly. Mm. And so in that way, we think that, well, we know that if kids have good dexterity and they're solving problems well with their hands, they tend to go on to have typical language development. And when they don't, there can often be problems maybe with their language development. So trying to think about new interventions and new ways to screen children is, is a possibility for us now. Understanding our evolutionary path can help inform our developmental path. And so we're taking the research in that direction. So you can kind of almost have an earlier intervention for a child that might need it and support Ex them th through that development. Exactly. That's, that is the hope and that would be the path we'd like to travel. And where have you taken this box? I feel like there have been some interesting other players, um, apart from me, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, the boxes have been a massive hit. They were funded by the Lieberhume Trust a few years ago. Um, we started with toddlers um, and looking at how they solve them and, and how that associates with their language learning. Um, and alongside them, they were being solved by gorillas, orangutans, um, and chimpanzees in um, wild animal parks and zoos here. But they've also now traveled to Liberia, Cameroon, and Gabon, being used across sanctuaries and release programs. Thank you so much, Julie. It's been absolutely brilliant to having a chat to you. Um, well, I'm certainly never going to think of apes in the same way again. Uh, Fran, are you still down in the labyrinth or have you escaped? I did Roma, but it's a little bit of sort of out of the frying pan and into the fire for me because I am here with a robotic arm behind me, which apparently is used for eye surgery, which Carlo, who is from King's College London, you're not going to do the surgery on me, are you? I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> no, we won't. <laughs> so what is it that we've got here? We have a nice uh, setup with a uh, seven degree of freedom uh, robotic arm, which uh, holds uh, the surgical robot, which helps uh, surgeons to deliver a better and uh, faster surgery for the patient, more precise and uh, at a microscopic uh, scale. Amazing. Can we take a closer look? Yeah, absolutely. Follow me. <laughs> In we go. So here we have uh, Shamsa, who will also help us uh, running the robot, uh, running Hi. automatic functions and keeping us safe. Brilliant. Um, and uh, this is our uh, fake eye. Yeah, okay, <laughs> so we'll okay, do okay, the surgery here. <laughs> and uh, yeah, and this is our robot. Brilliant. OK, so that's got the seven degrees of freedom, which means it's sort of, I suppose, is that seven joints? It can move in seven different ways. Exactly. Yeah, that's perfect. And uh, in a second, we are going to manipulate it. And if you like, uh, you can help me to do I that. I would love to do that, so, Carlo. Yeah. What yes. do we do? So let's go. You can press play. Thank you very much. So now we gently, you can hold this handle. OK. And we gently drive the robot towards the eye. You've said gently twice, I will be gentle. Yeah. <laughs> okay. We don't want to risk to damage the patient. Yes. So. Especially on the eyeball. Yeah. 
So it's not heavy, it's sort of holding its own, unless you're exactly. having the weight, it's holding its own weight. That's exactly the idea of uh, co-manipulation. Uh, Shamsa, could you please uh, stop it, please? Thank you. So this is a cobot, so it's designed to work with humans. Exactly. Brilliant. Uh, thanks to the programming we do, we basically measure how much uh, torque and forces are applied to the robot so that the robot knows how we are interacting with them. Brilliant. Uh, and uh, the robot knows where we want to go and it sort of helps us in uh, going there by compensating its own weight. Great, and, and it's here right at the eye at the moment. Yeah, exactly. So now uh, in the real surgery, we would be inserting a surgical tool. So oh, I thought you were going to <laughs> give that to me. I mean, yeah, you can do it. You can help me. <laughs> so you can pull this uh, trigger towards uh, the patient. This way? Yeah. Okay, yeah, and, and it slots in. Tiny. Yeah, and this one will slot in. Right. So now essentially the surgeon would be sitting at the console and uh, looking through the microscope image like an unsighted man uh, yeah. inside, uh, inside the eye and basically driving the surgical tool uh, to perform the injections around the macula rather than other um, uh, therapies that are uh, required. Brilliant. And so by using this robot and by using the microscope, you can just make tiny, tiny incisions and, and I suppose tiny surgery onto, right. and which is so important, onto the eyeball, right? Yeah, that's right. We can uh, reach uh, the retina. We could potentially even reach behind the eye. Uh, we can do basically so many more things that uh, the human uh, hands, because of tremors, because of... Um, lot of other uh, inconsistencies that uh, yeah. humans have. Absolutely, uh, we're imperfect, do. right? We're yeah. humans. And, and also like the classic tool is for a manual uh, eye surgery is straight. Yeah. While uh, we have the possibility to actually make them curve. I've been, I've been touching your computer, sorry. I hope I'm not... Oh, I'm no, no, that's fine. Don't worry. Uh, so I remove the tool. I can show you the tool. But the tools are curved. Oh. And according to how we control them, we can uh, achieve different positions, which allows us the flexibility that uh, the human with the manual tools don't have. That is incredible. Oh, Colin, we are going to have a lot of fun here. Roma, I have definitely got my hands full. I'm going to get to work, but for the meantime, it's back to you. Okay, so let's have a go. Yeah. Thank you, Fran. Now here to tell us more about this Continuum micro-robot we have Ross Henry. Hi, Ross. Hey, how are you doing? I am good. I've, I hear you've been busy with lots of students downstairs. Yeah, they've been great, so they are very interested <laughs> in this thing. That's brilliant. Tell me a little bit about your research and the work you're doing. So what we're doing is it's a collaboration between King's, Moorfields Eye Hospital and UCL. And we're trying to treat a number of different uh, blindness diseases causing blindness. So one of them's macular degeneration. Basically what this would do, if I'm looking at you, mm -hmm. I'd be able to see the periphery around me, but I wouldn't be able to see you. It's like the second largest cause of blindness in the world, Gosh. maybe coming up on first soon. Uh, but so there's this innovative treatment. treatment. It's a wee small patch that we can just put behind the retina. Mm -hmm. So the back of your eye. However, the issue is we're looking to go somewhere that's about half the size of human hair. So that's really hard for surgeons to work on. Just this is inside the eyeball, isn't it? The retina is the kind of the back surface of yeah. the eyeball, so isn't it? Yeah, so it'll be the very back side. Right. And it's like, so it's super safe. Like we end up, surgeons do, it's called vitoretinal surgery. Mm -hmm. It's done, there's probably like 40 cases a day of different types of it that's happening of this group of surgery that's happening at Moorfields every single day, probably a lot more. Uh, but we're trying to innovate and make it better. And the way we'll do that is so with this wee robot here. Yeah. And what this is, as you said, it's continuum. So it's essentially these pre-bent tubes, which will all, which nest inside each other. So we can either rotate them or translate them back and forth. Okay. And with that, we can create like this snake-like pattern. So the difference is in surgery these days, they just use a straight tool. Mm -hmm. But with this, it means we can access so many more areas of the eye. Okay. And then depending on like the device we use, uh, we can increase the accuracy or like remove tremors and stuff like that. Right. So, so basically we're talking about being operated on by a robot. Yeah. I mean, to be honest, having surgery in the inside of my eye makes me feel queasy anyway. Yeah. But then the idea of a robot doing it. Could, so, so is it safe? Like what are the things that you're investigating at the moment? So... 
Yeah, well, like the thing is, as I said, this type of surgery as an inside the eye, super common already, like it's completely normal. But with this here, we can make it safer than normal mm -hmm. surgery. Because what we can do is say if they're, because of course the back of your eye is super like sensitive. Mm -hmm. What we can do is we can remove hand tremors from like if a surgeon's hand, if they're trying to get to a very speci specific point. Or even with that, we can map it. So with like, they'll use like a stylus or a pen mm -hmm. to, to control the robot. And what we can do with that is if they move in their space, like a centimeter, it only moves a millimeter in the actual eye. So we can right. amplify, amplify their movement. Yeah, so talk to me a little bit about that interaction of, of the surgeon and the robot. What, yeah. what does that look like? So there's two, maybe three main ways. The first is like, as probably as we saw in the video, a, is a haptic device. So this is... So tell me what haptic means for those who don't know. So haptics for that, this is like, the system gives some kind of feedback. So like my phone, mm -hmm. you know, whenever you get a text or something and it vibrates, that's haptics. Mm -hmm. for so there's like a touch response. Exactly, yeah. it's some, It's that's exactly what it is. And with our system, what we're looking at is actually there's motors in this uh, device. And firstly, it can pick up where we actually are in the eye. It, it can tell the robot where to move. Mm -hmm. But if the robot starts moving somewhere which isn't safe, and the surgeon's going that direction, we can actually apply a force. Okay. And so it kind of stops the surgeon from maybe going to an area that might touch the side of the eye or something mm -hmm. like that. Just me means that we can minimize the system from straying off to somewhere it's not meant to. Ross, is using this kind of technique a little bit like almost shrinking down a surgeon and then sending them inside your body to do a bit of surgery on a scale that you couldn't really imagine? That's, that's a cool way of thinking about it. <laughs> yeah, I guess it is. So the tool that we end up using, the main one, it's called a forcep. It's basically like a claw. Mm -hmm. But what we're doing on this here is we're essentially, or like a, a hand almost, we're putting this here and it goes in and we're able to actually like use that really dexterously to like interact with different parts of the eye, like at the back of the retina. So say like if someone's got a detached retina, you can, it's like a surgeon going in and holding it and like almost like sewing the retina back onto wow. the eye. That's pretty much what it is. So yeah, a tiny surgeon inside. It's, it's definitely a good way of describing it. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely taking us down to a scale, I guess, that we hadn't really been able to do. Well, like, far. If you think about it, the tools we'll work with mm. is about 300 microns, it's a 0.3 millimeters. The area we're looking to go down to mm. is 50 microns, so that's a 20th of a millimeter. It's so small, yeah. like it's really hard to even fathom <laughs> something that small. And it's the reason why we use these here, like the scaling of the haptic mm. device and things. So we are able to actually get there and work with it properly. How did you come into this field? Um, and tell us a little bit about, like, I, I don't know, your interest as a child and how, what was your path to getting into this field of so science? So I had quite a wavy path getting here. I started off, I started off back home as a florist in Ireland. Wow. So it was great. But I came over to King's to study medicine. And when okay. I was a child, I either wanted to be an engineer or a doctor. And I didn't realize that I could do both. Yeah. Uh, so I came here for medicine and... At GKT, I really enjoyed it. Like it was amazing teaching. However, the study style just didn't suit me. One of my lecturers was a person called Caval Rhodes. He was teaching imaging. And so I got told, chat to him, he does biomedical engineering. Mm. My flatmate was one of his students. So I went there, I talked to him and I transferred course over to the bachelor's of biomed eng. And with nice. that, yeah, so I was working through my bachelor's and my Final year project was with Dr. Christos Bergelis, and I absolutely loved the work that I was doing with him. I went to him like a couple of months in, I was like, look, I love working with you. I love the team and I love the research. And I'm like, I want to stay on, do a, do a, batch, do a PhD or extend my studies. And he was kind enough. He thought my work was good enough. <laughs> and he, off, he offered me a PhD. And so since then I've, started my PhD, it's currently part-time because okay. the other half of my time I'm working at Moorfields and we're trying to get the robot into 
a through the quality management process, which is a lot. So you were saying about safety. Yes. We have 150 pages just for one part of the risk assessment. Wow. So every single step that we do is like lined up and everything yeah. so we can make it as safe as we can. That's, I mean, I, I really love the fact that you were able to bring engineering and medicine together. And I think sometimes we forget that we can actually yeah. kind of almost practice medicine as an engineer or a scientist. So yeah. you're a great role model for that example. Well, um, yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for joining me, Ross. Um, now, I said at the start that Fran would be doing all the slightly dangerous stuff that I don't want to. Um, and this is a prime example because the next stand is all about electricity. Hello again. I am here with Nina Ball from the National Physical Laboratory, or NPL. Nina, hi. What is NPL? Yeah, so at NPL, we're the National Physical Laboratory, so we're the National Metrology Institute for the UK. So that means that we hold the primary standards for all of the SI units. So basically what that means, like, so an SI unit is like a kilogram or a metre exactly. or anything that we measure. You tell us what that actually means. Yes, exactly, yes. And the seconds, for example, and another of those uh, units is the ampere, which is what we're talking about today. So the ampere is the unit that is used to measure uh, electrical current, essentially. And the ampere is what we, what we normally know as the amp, right? Yes. Yes, um, so yeah, we're talking about measuring electricity today and um, on this stand we just really wanted to demonstrate you know, what, what an ampere looks like because electricity, it's not really something that you can see so it, it can be quite hard to um, conceptualise what that looks like. Absolutely, it's not something that's tangible, is it? And so yeah. like, yeah, like what is an amp? Exactly, yeah, yeah so that is, that is the question of, uh, of this stand. So what we're aiming to do is um, is to turn this handle. Oh, it's been calling me this handle. <laughs> so I give it a tip. Okay. Yes. So the idea is that we turn it to generate uh, roughly an amp in current. Oh, I got like this is harder than I thought. <laughs> So the idea is that that should be enough to uh, power these kind of everyday items to give you an appreciation of just how much um, electrical current goes into an amp to run all of these items. A lot! <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and this is what an ampere is, isn't it? Yes, so that, is, um, that means that we're running uh, just over 6 million billion electrons per second through that current, through that circuit. Oh God, just, just a few then? Just a few, exactly. And this is the type of stuff that you do, you look at actually what an amp means, what a meter means, what a kilogram means, what anything that we measure actually means in practice and you make sure that people stick to it so a meter doesn't end up becoming like 30 centimeters. Exactly, exactly. It's all about yeah, accuracy and pre precision in those measurements and enabling confidence uh, in those measurements. And why is that important? So particularly the, the amperes um, is really important because um, you know most of our, our household items kind of operate in this you know amp region. And you see and that on the back of plugs don't you? Yeah. 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 Yeah, exactly. So, you know, going up the scale, it'll take thousands of, uh, thousands of amps to operate, you know, buildings and cars and things. But what we're really good at doing at MPL is, um, is looking at some of these lower levels um, of readings and really, really tiny um, amounts of current and electricity. That is super small. Yes, yeah, so that is 10 to the minus 21 Zepto amp. And that means that we can count uh, individual electrons going through a current and going through a circuit. And that's important because um, electrical devices, they're, they're designed to work off a certain amount of amps, isn't it? So we've got to make sure that they're right. Exactly, yeah, exactly. And as, as we go down the scale, you know, wristwatches operate from pico amps, but as we go, um, down into more and more sensitive devices, the, the applications of that almost become um, more and more important. So for example, you know, pico amps are required to operate radiation detectors. So it's really important to know that the current going through that device is accurate so that we can trust those measurements. Absolutely. Oh gosh, yes. Yeah. So not only are you measure well coming up with the standards for measuring electricity but measuring electricity and making sure that that's right means that other measurements are yes. correct and without standard measurements we don't really have science right well exactly yeah it's all about the confidence in those measurements and the confidence um yeah in those readings and absolutely calibration. so yes this is a lot of fun yeah but it's actually got a, a serious meaning behind it exactly yeah oh and it certainly is a lot <laughs> of fun Roma, i'm gonna be on here but back to you and let's see if i can get this any higher Oh, come on, red car, come on! Keep going, Fran. I think you're very nearly there. 
Well, I'm pleased to have John Fletcher from the National Physical Laboratory in the studio with me. Welcome, John. Hello there. And um, we're going to be talking about electricity. Tell us what electricity is. Yeah, that's it's an interesting question. I think a lot of people have difficulty understanding electricity. And historically, um, uh, we we didn't necessarily have a very clear microscopic picture of what it was. Um, the, the originators of era, um, the first electrical measurements, uh, the, the people that sort of uh, paved the way and set the foundations for, for electrical metrology, the people after whom the units are named, like Ampere, they didn't really have a very clear microscopic view of, of what it really was. They could generate it and they could even use it, um, but they, they didn't, didn't really know what the real picture was. Um, and so uh, the, the, the developments that we have in uh, modern technology for and nanotechnology mean that we can start to see what electricity is and use that, that, that uh, microscopic view of it. And that's the flow of electrons, yep, which are the, the negatively charged particles inside the atom. And Nina has just told Fran on the exhibition floor that you can now measure electricity by the electron. Yeah, I, we have devices in our lab that can dispense electricity in its sort of most granular form. I can, I, can, I can inject an electron into circuit one at a time. And wow. this, is, this is a kind of, um, this is a, it's, it's, it's a sort of miraculous capability, really. It's a bit like dispensing water one molecule at a time. Maybe if you turn the tap on and turn it off yeah, really yeah, quickly, yeah. then you, you, that, that's, the, that's, the, that's how um, astounding it is to be able to control particles at this scale. And it's, um, it, it means that if you're an electrical metrologist, it naturally appeals as, a, as the kind of thing that you would like to support your measurement system because electrons are this uh, universal, identical, reproducible uh, f um, particle. Unit, yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's, like, it, it, it's a bit like um, if, somebody, if somebody pays you, then they pay you in pounds and mm -hmm. you know what a pound is and everybody agrees on what a pound is and then you know that you've been paid the correct amount of money. If I give you a precise number of electrons, then you know you, you know how much charge I've given you, and, and it's the same kind of precision accounting, but in the electrical domain. Yeah. So, so this is like a, this is a very tiny scale of electricity, yeah. and I want to talk more about that in a minute. But what about the very large scale of electricity? Like, what's the biggest quantity of electricity ah, that? Yeah. So that's a really interesting <laughs> question. Yeah. So so for, so when we were designing the stand, we, we we tried to work out how to kind of um, how to orient people with respect to the size of the ampere. Um, because people have a lot of um, people have a day-to-day -day experience of what a kilogram is or what a what a, yes, that's true. Um, a and and what a meter is and so on. But giving people an idea of what an amp represents is more difficult. Um, and so a lot of what we've been doing is is just sort of filling in the basics. Um, if you, I guess, one way of quantifying a large amount of electricity would be to add, add together the the power consumption of all of the of all of the uh, of all of the electricity generators in the world. Mm. Um, but even, even one amp itself is a huge number of electrons. It's six billion billion electrons flowing per second. So even, wow. even before you start to get to a big scale of electricity, you already have a lot of electrons on your hands. Which is why Fran is struggling upstairs, <laughs> I think. Yeah. Um, what, with these tiny bits of electricity, are they useful? Yeah, so I think the um, uh, small current metrology, um, this, the sort of picoamperes, and nanoamperes and femtoamperes, even really, 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 really tiny currents. So these are fractions They're, of yeah, tiny. Exactly, the it's it's, it's astonishing. So so people, um, a, a lot of people that work, even people that work in electrical measurement, mm -hmm. they don't realise that currents get this small and still have some meaning. So if you're an electrician, you spend your life dealing with amps, and maybe you know about milliamps. Maybe you're interested in the the limit of sensitivity, like how much electricity can go through somebody's body before they realise this. But all of those amounts of current are huge compared to the amount that a radiation detector. Or, or a particle detector, or or, or, a, or a light sensor might might receive, um, and so the the requirement for to calibrate things at these low current levels is is is, is, a, is a real need, um, and but from my own personal perspective, one of the things that's interesting about electron pumps is that um, controlling electrons is a quantum mechanical thing. You're you're, you're not dealing with like a ping pong balls. Yeah. You're dealing with this quantum particle. So some of the interesting avenues are to try and harness the, the quantumness of electrons um, and use those for um, sensing or computing applications that, that use uh, quantum mechanics. And this is why um, NPL's quantum technology program is supporting this kind of development because you want to explore quantum, you want to explore quantum mechanics and the, the way that it can be exploited. Um if we just come back to the, the measurements of electricity, why is it important to have a kind of a base 
yeah, uniform it's, unit it's, there? It's, it's a, it's, that's a really good question because it's something that I think you, a lot of people take for granted. They assume that everybody can always agree on, mm. on, on things. And the metrology community is actually a really great community because we all work together and we all, because we all know how important it is for measurements to cross borders and cross boundaries. Um, so um, the, by having um, things that are based on fundamental physics like the charge on the electron, it means that we can always agree on, on quantifying electricity. Um, and the, the, it's, a, it's, a, it's a universal property of, of that. So my electrons are the same as your electrons and somebody in another country, they also have the same kind of electrons. And if you want to do exactly the same experiment on the moon or somewhere else, then you will always get the same answer. And that's guaranteed if you do it this way, but it isn't guaranteed if you do it by making special batteries or any other kind of artifact based system. Thank you so much, John. Now, you wouldn't think that humans had much in common with zebrafish, but we share more than you might guess. In fact, zebrafish could hold a key to understanding our mental health. Fran is going fishing to find out more. I certainly am Roma, and I am somewhat transfixed by these little fellas right here. These are zebrafish, but I wonder what they've got to do with studying mental health. Well, someone here to help me is Jen Wong. So, Jen, what have these got to do with mental health? How are they helping us, these zebrafish? We study zebrafish, um, especially the genes and psychiatric diseases. Did you know 70% of our genes we share with these? 70%? Yes, yes. and Whoa. about 80% of, of proteins that are associated with human diseases have a zebrafish counterpart. Gosh, that makes them such a good model exactly. for us studying ourselves. Yes, we do gene editing using CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing system to right. knock out the specific genes that we're interested in and to explore the association between genes and behaviours. Understood. So you knock out certain genes, get rid of them, stop them from working, and then you look at what happens to the fish behaviour. Exactly. The best part is we have three very similar structure of brains between zebrafish and human. If you go there with Giovanni, and he will show you the structure of the brain. Ah, oh, thank you. Ah, oh, hi Giovanni. Oh, hi. Oh, gosh. Okay. So, wow, this looks impressive. What have we got here? A lot of lights. A lot, of definitely a lot of lights. Uh, what yeah. are those lights? So, here we have the section of the front part of the zebrafish brain. Right. On this other side, we have the same front part, the same section, for the mammal brain. Okay, and we're mammals, the obviously. We're mammals as well. Yeah. And as we can see, the same colored region, the same lighted region, are the same brain region that we share with the zebrafish, with the little fella there. For example, we have the isocortex here, the blue part, lighted yeah. in blue. And that's and then, this bit here. Absolutely. And as we can see, we have the same light also for the learning, for our emotion, for our voluntary movements, and the same goes for the other part of the brain. For example, the amygdala there, the yellow bits, yeah. or for the pallidum part, the green lights. And so the lights that come on, not only do they show us the where the regions are that we have in common, but also what they sort of influence in our behavior. Absolutely, absolutely. That's the amazing thing about zebrafish, because since we share the same brain region, since we share the same DNA, basically, we really can use zebrafish as a great model organism. can tell us so much about our mental health. And so, yeah, by using the zebrafish as a model, you can knock out certain genes, see what the result is. And then I suppose from that, not only can you see a change potentially in behavior, but then also look at where drugs might be good to be used and what effects they might have. Absolutely. That is actually one of the final goals because we share 84% of the proteins involved in human diseases with the zebrafish. So if you're able to target this protein, we can absolutely improve the human health in general, not only the mental health. So combined with all of these, you can see why actually it's a genius fish. Gosh, who would have known that those little beasts right there share so much in common with us and can actually help our well-being. Gosh, I'm learning so much, it's fantastic. Back to you, Roma. Thanks, Fran. I'm here with Adele Leggieri from Queen Mary University. Welcome, Adele. It's great to have you here. 
Thank you. It's a great pleasure to be here with you today. And um, tell me a little bit about your area of research. So we use zebrafish, which is a small freshwater fish, to study genetic variants associated with human psychiatric disease. Okay. So what we do is genetically modify the DNA of this little fish. We turn off specific genes using the CRISPR-Cas9 technique. And then we see what happens in terms of behavioral and molecular effects. So, I mean, it seems quite counterintuitive that zebrafish and humans might have much in common. So could you explain a little bit about that? So we share 70% of our genes with zebrafish. Wow. And 84% of the genes which in human are associated with psychiatric diseases have a zebrafish counterpart, which makes it a really a good translational uh, model for human studies. So does that mean, I guess, if, if there's so much commonality between humans and zebrafish, particularly in the terms of mental health, does that mean the zebrafish have some kind of mental health? So we can, so zebrafish have traits that characterize human um, psychiatric diseases. So if we can measure anxiety, mm -hmm. we can measure their aggressive behavior, uh, impulsivity, uh, they can get addicted to drugs, so we can actually also study addiction diseases in zebrafish. So what are you trying to gain from your research overall? What, you know, what is the kind of the goal by using zebrafish? So we aim to find, uh, to identify as much genes as possible, because when it comes to psychiatric diseases, it's not just one gene, it's more than one gene uh, together that causes this diseases. So we uh, aim to identify more genes, of course, and uh, possibly find therapeutic targets to treat human. So what we're saying is that if um, a human has some kind of mental health issue, it's quite complex to isolate just one or two or yes. maybe, you know, those yes. number of genes to then, I guess, so are you trying to predict perhaps which kind of people might be more susceptible to... Yes. Yeah, and then yes, like absolutely. early interventions or anything like that. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Especially because we have to bear in mind that it's not just the genes, it's like a strict gene environment interaction. So it's like 50% of the genes and 50% of the environment. So I'm sure you read about studies in twins. So mm -hmm. same DNA, same genetics, but uh, one was living in one side of the world and the other one in the other side of the world. And um, despite the same DNA, so the same genetics, uh, someone was showing signs of anxiety, for example, or ADHD, autism, and the other one was not. Mm. Because it's not just a gene, it's more than one gene, and together with a lot of genes is the environment as well. I mean, it sounds so fascinating and Honestly, I don't think I would have ever made a link between zebrafish and the human mental health. So it's been really interesting to hear about your research. Thank you so much for joining Thank me. Thank you for having me here today. Now from tiny fish to the vastness of the universe, my next guest will be taking us into outer space, but not quite in the way that you might expect. For the majority of us who are unlikely to visit space, Marina has invented a surprising way for us to experience it. And that is Aram Atom. Marina, welcome to Summer Science Live and Thank thanks for much. joining me. Now tell me about what this surprising way is. How can I experience space in the Royal Society today? Okay, so my special way to help you experience space is through your nose. Okay. So I'm very keen on making sure that people use all their senses when it comes to learning. And when it comes to something like space, it's so far away, so distant. And as you said, most of us are never going to go there. So the only way we can experience it is through your senses here on Earth. And there's loads of images, um, there's, there's even sounds from space, yes. but smell is something that if you go out to space, you're not going to be able to smell because obviously you need to have a helmet on to be able to breathe. But the chemistry of space is out there. So what I have done is try to bring the chemistry of space to Earth so that we can smell it here and experience that dimension of space. But it's um, almost it's beyond anybody's ability, really. That sounds so fascinating. So what, what have we got here in front of us now? Okay, so what we've got here are three smells that I've chosen okay. for yeah. you. So let me just get them here. I think that is Mars. We're going to go to the first one, which is the closest one to us. So this is um, something that mimics 
what we think the smooth, the, pardon, the, sorry, <laughs> my, my uh, Spanish is coming through, what the moon might smell like. Mm -hmm. Now, we have accounts from the Apollo astronauts mm -hmm. telling us the smells that they experienced after they went out on their moonwalks, came back into the spacecraft. Okay, and don't tell me what they said. Dust. I'm going to have a go and yeah. you can tell me after I have a sniff. I, I won't tell you, but <laughs> so they've said things and that's what I have tried to create okay. in here. So before I tell you anymore, I'm just going to let you smell it and yeah, see yeah. What, you, what you think. Hmm. I feel like it smells a little bit like peppery. Okay. Maybe a bit I don't know, like after something's burnt in a room or something, maybe? What, what was the astronaut's take on... Okay, so what you're smelling is something that, thing, that sort of tickles your nose yeah. and there's a smokiness to it as well. Mm. And there's a reason for that. So the first one is the accounts of astronauts tell us that the majority of them agree that it smells something like spent gunpowder. So I've never smelled gunpowder, but if you imagine the smell of fireworks after a big firework display, I was trying to capture something like that. However, when you look at the mineralogy of the moon, it wouldn't smell like that. The minerals that we find on the moon would be pretty much odorless. So the most you would get is maybe some form of mineral kind of note, like earthy note. So that's what I've done here. I've mixed the smokiness with the earthiness, which is what tickles your nose to mm. give you also that sensation of dust getting through your nostrils, like it would have happened to them. So that's what you were thinking, the kind of maybe peppery, the peppery, because it tickles yeah, yeah, your nose. Yeah. And that's me trying to create a sensation of dust coming through your nostrils. That's amazing. So that's what you've got here. It's amazing that you can do that with it's like smell. a few kind of chemicals and yeah. yeah, that's incredible. Yeah. So that's the first one I've Great. got for you. Fantastic. I have got the second one here. It's no, not that one. It's this one here. So this is the smell of Mars. Now we obviously haven't sent any humans to Mars yet, but uh, we do know a lot about Mars mm -hmm. because we've been studying it for decades. So I'm going to let you smell okay. this, see what you think. Hmm, this is very different. There's a kind of, I don't know, acidic sweetness mm -hmm. type of thing. Yeah, it's it's almost like it's almost pleasant, but then a little bit unpleasant as yeah. well. It's like, I'm, oh, I'm not quite sure if I like the smell or not. Okay, um, probably I don't like it. Um, and you are right. What you have here is a mixture of... Um, what we call perfume notes that are metallic and kind of like rusty metal, uh, very cool. And there's also um, the sweetness you're talking about. It's it's a kind of metallic sweetness. That's what I was trying it's to say. It's like there. blood. That's what it is, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So if you think about Mars being orange, that's because it's covered literally in rust. Mm. <laughs> and so what I was trying to create with this is that smell of rust that we might find on the surface of Mars. But there is something else about Mars. Um, obviously, the, the smell of Mars will have changed through its history. And there was a period of time when Mars had a lot of active volcanoes and the smell would have been very different back then and that's the kind of smell that you might find in places like Venus as well or places like Io which is a volcanic moon that orbits Jupiter so I do have a surprise smell for you okay related to Mars but also to all these other places okay. that um, have volcanoes in them so I'm gonna I'm gonna give you that one now Okay, I'm not going to tell you anything about it. Are you ready for I'm this? Ready. Okay, I'm ready. I've got it here. It's a secret thing that I've got here for oh, you. Oh, gosh. Okay. Okay. Why is it in a plastic bag? Ah, well. <laughs> <laughs> so, with this is, very gently okay. approach it with your nose very, very gently. Don't get too close to it. Uh, and then it will probably hit you. Mm. Yeah, that's quite an unpleasant one. Yes. A so bit tarry, maybe? It's a bit tarry, yeah. but it's also very stinky. Yeah. Uh, if you've ever smelled a stink bomb, you have something similar in here. Okay, that's, these, so hence the zip lock yeah, kind of Yeah, there's a little like, warning sign there <laughs> that my colleague put on there. And the reason we have this one is because... Um, 
If you think about volcanic gases, if you've ever been near a volcano, you may have experienced the smell of rotten eggs. So that's actually what you've got. That's in sulfur, there. isn't that's it? We sulfur. talked to Richie this morning, who was explaining um, what volcanoes smell like as well. Yeah. So. That's that's what that is. So that's that was, intense. Yeah, that's very intense, and that's one of them that I don't normally have out because we don't want the whole place smelling <laughs> of rotten egg. And the last one I've got here that I'm going to give you is one of my favourite ones. Um, this is a smell that is related to. Not just the Milky Way, but mm. a specific molecular cloud near the oh. center of the Milky Way called Sagittarius B2. I can already smell it. So I feel like this has a little bit of that gunpowdery maybe yeah. kind of vibe, but also the sweetness. There's definitely like a sweet... I'm not going to say rose, but it's... I don't know, there's some fruity. kind of flowery or fruity... fruity. Yeah. Sweetness to it. Fruity. Do you smell the sort of alcohol as well? Or like, oh, that's almost true. like, like nail a nice polish. cocktail. Yeah. Yeah. So, this is what I like to call mm. my space party smell. <laughs> and the reason, <laughs> so when you go out into deep space, there are, you know, so many molecules out there. Some of them don't have smell, like helium or hydrogen, but some of them do have smells. Some have horrendous smells, like hydrogen sulfide, rotten eggs, and all this are a bit nicer. And when we looked into this particular part of the Milky Way, we detected many things, including a molecule called ethyl formate. And ethyl formate captured the imagination of so many people, because it's a molecule that you find inside fruit on Earth. Okay. Yeah. And you find it inside raspberries. So next time you eat a raspberry, you can think you're eating a molecule that's in the center of the Milky Way. That's but in reality, a film form it does not smell like raspberries. It smells a little bit like nail, nail polish mm -hmm. and there's an alcoholic rum type of smell. So what I have done there is create a blend of raspberry notes with... Um, acetone and sort of nail polish type of notes and rum alongside the ethyl formate molecule to give you that space cocktail that you have at your space party at the center of the Milky Way. Oh, that sounds, it sounds like a fun party. Definitely yeah. one that I would love to join. Um, thank you so much, Marina. I mean, not only is the way you describe all of this so poetic and beautiful, but I really enjoyed smelling all this stuff and I feel like I've been on this stellar journey. So thank you very much. You're welcome. Um, Fran, what's changed at your end since I've been gone? Oh, Roman, all this running around. I'm getting a bit old for this. I've got some aches and pains. But to be honest, I have come to exactly the right place, haven't I, Miriam? Fran, you've come to exactly the right place. So we're developing the first national rehabilitation centre for the country. We've never had one before. We're right in the centre of the country near Nottingham and Loughborough. And we will be combining clinical teams with research and teaching and training all in one centre, uh, right next door to the military centre, which is already there, which was, to be honest, was the catalyst for this programme. Sounds great. Sounds exactly Amazing. what's needed. Exactly what's needed. So if you have a bad traffic accident or you have a period of illness and you need that rehab process, then we'll be getting people through really early in their journey, giving them that intense burst so that they can then go back into their community and work settings and, and carry on progressing. And some of the tech that we're developing will help that ongoing process. And by having everything in one place, yeah, it means that the tech that you can use could be things that if it was just small practices, they perhaps couldn't get hold Absolutely. of. Absolutely. So research sometimes takes a long time to get into clinical practice. So we're doing it all at the same space. Uh, yeah, and I'll hand over to Mark, who can tell you more about the tech. Oh, Mark, thank come you. in, come in. I want to know a bit more. Thank you so, so much, all, Miriam. I'm, I'm going to start with this person. Oh, a little axolotl. A little axolotl. Yeah. Um, the reason this is an interesting creature, because if it loses a limb, it can grow one back. Absolutely. And one of the things which we've talked about is if that happened to you or you needed a new limb, what could you do about it and what steps would you need to take and then what would need to happen after those things had happened? So, for example, in our stand, we're talking a little bit how you might be able to grow new tissues, grow new tissues for your arm or your leg, whatever. Then when you did that, how would you monitor them? What kind of um, interventions would you do to make sure that the tissue actually worked properly? And, and integrate. And integrate and it, exactly. absolutely. What supports would you need? What devices might you need to be able to monitor what you did and how you did it? And I think the thing to say, which has moved on most, I think, for the last decade for this work, is we have stem cells, we have 3D printed materials, we have smart materials, we have wearable technologies, we have smartphone apps, and all that stuff coming together enables us to do some of the things we want to do. And Pip's going to demonstrate some of it to you now. And thank you so much, Mark. Pip, it's all about making it obtainable, isn't it? And to be used in your home. Yeah, and, this, and what we're going to do is get you to sit on this. I was going to say, you're gesturing for me to sit, sit down. Sit down on this sensor mat. Okay. And this is a, a game, really, to help oh, okay. you 
build up your muscles in your bottom. So on the screen, that's my bottom. That's right? your bottom on the screen, <laughs> and you've got quite a nice symmetrical bottom there. Thank but what thank we'd you. like you to do is to try and build up some more muscle. And so you're going to lean forward and back and start moving okay. the little black dot on the screen. That black and dot. And what there. you'll be doing when you go around is knocking out those um, those little things. And this helps our patients actually do more exercise and um, get okay. more rehabilitation. I'm going and to go this way. People can do it in their own homes. They can do it. Oh, 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 oh hey! Got one, got one, got the yellow one. You're going to go for the green one? This is really good um, fun. It is really good fun. But also, yeah, it means it. that we can actually get lots of people working together at the same time, doing it because of the, the devices that we've set up. Yeah, because of course it's just a mat with a TV, TV screen, so you could yeah. do it at home, or you could get people just all in a room together. It's not just like this one-off treatment that people have just got to go one no. at a time. And when you have rehab, you need to do it lots and lots and lots. So oh, people oh! can do more. Motivates yes. you to do even more. <laughs> it's the gamification of it, right? It's brilliant. Yeah, oh, this is well. a lot of fun. I haven't sat down all day, Pip. This is brilliant. <laughs> uh, Roma, I am going to continue playing this, but in the meantime, it's back to you. Go on, Hank. Come oh, on. No, come. Uh, oh, maybe your muscles. Way. Maybe my muscles forward. have run out. Run, out, run out. <laughs> You can't sit still, can you, Fran? Um, well, I'm here with Andrew Capel from the University of Loughborough to talk more about their pioneering work. Welcome, Andy. Um, now, I have a dodgy hip from, I'm guessing from my pregnancy, it's been there for a long time. How many people are affected by having some kind, you know, aches and pains and injuries that need rehab rehabilitation? Um, well, any one time we think there's about one in three people in the UK yeah. are undergoing some form of rehabilitation. Uh, I, think, I think probably the thing to consider is that when we're talking about rehabilitation, we're not always thinking about prosthetics or splints or wheelchairs, we're thinking about a much broader kind of subset of uh, life-changing events or conditions so you're thinking kind of mental health physical health as well so yeah one in three at any one, any one time and part of the work you do is growing muscles in a lab tell me more about that so at the moment if you want to develop a new treatment or a new therapy then the process that you have to go through is you have to do some basic laboratory culture works you then have to test it in animals and then you put it in through to human trials Obviously, the middle part of that, the, the animal testing, has a lot of ethical issues associated with it, so we want to remove that. And the human part of it is quite challenging because in terms of throughput, it's difficult to do large-scale studies. So what we're trying to do is, is recreate human biology, but in a laboratory. So we're growing miniaturized uh, organoids, if you like, that can do what a human being does, which allows us to test out lots of new treatments and lots of new therapies in a rapid way, and then we can develop new treatments from there. Looking forward into the future, what we hope to be able to do is actually grow tissues that completely mimic an individual's biology. And then if a tissue was damaged or lost as a result of a, an injury or disease, then we'd be able to use that tissue to, to replace the tissue that was damaged or lost. And when you're, do, when you're testing these drugs or therapies on the stuff that you're growing in the lab, even if you're growing like a smaller organ, does it scale up? Yeah, so that's one of the one of the real challenges of the technology is the scalability. So there's there's a biological challenge towards that. Um, in the body, you have a uh, vascular system that provides oxygen and nutrients to the tissues that keeps them alive. So you need to be able to recreate that biologically. But then there's also a manufacturing scalability as well. So you need to produce cellular material basically on a large enough volume so that you can you can manufacture big bits of tissue. But theoretically, there's no limitations. And then you send them to the gym, I hear. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we do send them to the gym. So you think how a human being develops, it's, it's obviously born and then it starts to kind of load itself and goes through exercise. It takes a long period of time for, for humans to get to that kind of physically mature state. Yeah. We don't want to be growing our tissues for 21 years before we can send them out into the real wide world. So what we try and do is we, we try and fast track that process. So basically we put them through a gym, a gym protocol. So what that means in reality is we provide them with either little electrical impulses that recreate the, the electrical impulses that come from your brain. Just like, or, like you're doing like 50 crunches in yeah, exactly. half a second or yeah. something. <laughs> or, we, or we physically stretch them, um, which again recreates the kind of the, the biological movement that you might do in a, in a gym regime. And we can effectively change that to, to different uh, exercise regimes that mimic maybe a, a kind of resistance training or an endurance training session or something like that. So we can, we can tailor the tissues whichever way we want them to go. And are those muscles then being used directly in the human body in some way, or is it mainly to, to do the studies alongside? 
to the person. Yeah, so at the moment, the, the kind of state of the art is that we can manufacture tissues that, that kind of look and behave like human beings and we can use them for uh, clinical testing. As we move forward, where we want to get to is we want those tissues to, to mimic exactly your biology. So right. for instance, I could take a, um, either a blood sample or a skin swab, get the cells from that, and then culture that up into a tissue that, that mimics exactly what you would do in response to a specific therapy. And then moving forward into the, into the future, then we're looking at potentially implantation of, of lost, lost tissue. And what would, what would that allow you to treat? Yes, that's, that's a really interesting question. A lot of uh, life-changing events are um, not expected. So in those instances, it, it might be more challenging to have a, a kind of a bank of tissue um, sort of stored away. But where you maybe have a chronic condition, where you're struggling to treat something via a, a normal process and you're maybe getting degradation of the tissue over a long period of time, then you could look at a route where you actually ask someone to, to maybe donate, a, donate some blood or some cells and we'll go away and and culture up some tissue in the lab and then come back and, and maybe surgically replace the, the tissue that's failing. So it allows it to kind of be rejuvenated and gain a new life, I guess, fresh lease of life. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So where there's a, where there's a defect in, the, in the, the natural biology, then we could, we could replace that defect and, and kind of yeah, look to then go through a normal rehabilitative process with that kind of new healthy tissue. Yeah. I mean, it sounds like you must be working with like a big different range of people, different kind of degrees, backgrounds, areas of research. Could you tell me a little bit about how all of that comes together? I, th I think uh, uh, effective research needs teams of people who come from different backgrounds as well. I don't think yeah. it's a great team if everyone has the same skill set. So um, the team that we have at Loughborough is really diverse. We recruit people from, from all different facets of life. So it's a really, really nice balance of people to work with. And what have you been telling all the students that have been visiting your stall? What are the kind of questions and you know, what are the interests? Oh, I've, I've not been on yet. You've not so been on no, yet? <laughs> no, I'm, I'm my first session's after this. So uh, yeah, I'll have to get back to you on that one. Oh, really? Well, good luck with that. I think they're a very energetic bunch, but it's been great to talk to you about your research. Now, um, I am sad to say that we are nearing the end of our show here at the Royal Society Summer Exhibition. But we have just enough time for a very special guest who's going to tell us about a seven-year mission to the icy moons of Jupiter. That's coming up next. Michelle Doherty is a space physicist who specializes in the giant planets, Saturn and Jupiter, and their moons. She's currently leading on the JUICE mission, which hopes to confirm if there are liquid oceans under the frozen surfaces of Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto. And if so, could they support life? Michelle, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for inviting me. Um, tell me a little bit about how long your search for alien life has been going on. Probably my own involvement the last 15 or 20 years. Okay. Because um, I was involved in the Cassini spacecraft mission that went to Saturn, yeah. and my team made a discovery of outgassing of water vapor from one of the small moons called Enceladus. And we realized that there was a liquid water ocean underneath the surface of Enceladus. But I think for me, probably one of the most important realizations planetary scientists have come to in the last 15 to 20 years, is the fact that if you're looking for liquid water in our solar system, you don't have to look close to the sun. Mm. You can look much further away from the sun in the outer planets, but it's not on the surface, it's underneath the surface. Yes, yeah, so even though you basically it's really far away and not getting much of the sun's heat, that's not necessarily required to create liquid water. That's right. And there's a ball lying here. There is a here, ball, just conveniently just there. I will there. make use of. So <laughs> what we think is happening at the three moons that we're going to is that as they orbit around Jupiter, their orbit is not quite circular. Mm -hmm. And so at times they're closer to Jupiter and its gravitational field than on others. And when they're closer, the moon gets squeezed a bit. Right. And so as it's orbiting around, it gets squeezed at different rates as it's going around. And that's helping keep the interior molten. Because of this movement. Kind because, of of the, because of the movement mm. of the moon under the 
effect of the gravitational field of Jupiter. So it's called, it's called tidal forcing or tidal, tidal heating is a better way to describe it. So as it's orbiting around Jupiter, the interior changes shape as it's going around Jupiter. That's really interesting. Now, tell me a little bit, let's rewind back. What was your um, story about coming into the career and, and science in the first place? It was quite weird. You know, I said yes to some things I wasn't sure if I could do. Um, but if, 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 if we go back to when I was a child in South Africa, mm -hmm. my dad built his own telescope. I remember he ground the That's sort right. of mirror of the telescope. Um, and my sister and I did what we thought was the most important thing, and that was mix the concrete for the actual base of the telescope. I mean, concrete is the most important thing. As a structural engineer, I'm, I the, completely There you go. Agree. There you go. And, and, you know, if we hadn't been able to do that, then the telescope wouldn't have been able to stand up oh, by itself. Yeah. Foundations are the most important <laughs> thing. Absolutely. So, in fact, my first view of Jupiter and its moons was through the telescope in our front garden. Wow. And I also saw Saturn and its rings as How well. How old were you at this point? I was about 12 or 13. Okay. So quite a formative sort of experience, I guess. Yes, but I was at an all-girls school in South Africa and they didn't teach science. Not at all. And so, in fact, I did maths and biology and Accountancy, I think. Those were the, my main three subjects. So no physics? No physics. Right. But I was good at maths mm -hmm. and um, I didn't know what I wanted to do. And I was fortunate my dad worked at the local university and so I could get in for free. That's, that's good. <laughs> and they took a chance on me. The physics department took a chance on me and they said, OK, why don't you do a BSc? I didn't know if I could do it. But it turns out I really enjoyed physics. But I got wow. a PhD in applied maths. I then went to Germany on a two-year fellowship, and then yeah. I was offered a job at Imperial College. And after about six months at Imperial College, I was asked if I wanted to put a magnetic field model together mm -hmm. for a spacecraft mission that was going to Jupiter. Oh, I didn't right. know I'll do that. about it, but it sounded quite cool, so I said yes. So It sounds like this is a good philosophy in life, to do things that we're not really sure we can do. I <laughs> think so. There are times you need to be brave, mm. um, and you sort of learn on the job. Yeah. Um, I now think I vaguely know what I'm doing, but I said yes to something I wasn't sure of, but it was really exciting. And so that's how I got into planetary science. It's absolutely incredible. Now, um, tell me about this very exciting sounding project, JUICE. What does it stand for? What is it doing? Okay, so it's a, it's a rather long-winded acronym, but it stands for Jupiter Icy Moon Explorer. I like it. Um, but what was really interesting is when we came up with the name, the European Space Agency said to us, really? Juice? Is that, that the best you can do? We're going to change the name after launch. Right. And then we were launched a couple of months ago, yeah. and I said to them, are you going to change the name? Oh, no, we quite like it now. <laughs> so Juice is what it's going it's to be. It's memorable. And, it um, is memorable. Yeah. Um, yes. So the, the mission's going to take about seven and a half years, you mentioned. What, what is the objective of the mission? Okay, so um, there are two different objectives. One is to try and understand the Jupiter system, mm -hmm. but the, the the one that I think is the is the real driver is to get an understanding about whether there's the potential for life to form. Um, and that's in these kind of subterranean liquid water environments. That's right. So yeah. there are three moons, uh, three of the large Galilean moons, yeah. which we're almost certain have got liquid water oceans underneath the surface. And can you give us an idea of the scale of these compared to planet Earth of the moons? Okay, so um, the biggest moon uh, is Ganymede. Yeah. And it is about the same size as Mercury. Okay. So it's about a third of the size of yeah. the Earth. Yeah, yeah. Um, and if there is this liquid water ocean on Ganymede, which we're almost certain there is, wow. If it's a global ocean, there'll be more water in that ocean than there is on the lick on the water oceans on the Earth. Wow! So that gives you an idea about how much water like there the scale will of... be out there. Yes, yeah. Yes. But um, so if you're if you're looking to see where the life can exist, there are four things that you need. Yeah. You need liquid water. Mm -hmm. You need a heat source of some kind. You need organic material. And then you need those first three ingredients to be stable enough over a long enough period of time that something can actually happen. And so that's what we want to do with juice, is we want to confirm that there's liquid water there, confirm their heat sources. We're almost certain there are because the water wouldn't be liquid sure. if there wasn't a heat source. Um, see if there's organic material. Mm. And then those are three of the four. Yeah. 
for ingredients, ingredients. that we're actually searching for. Yeah. And are you going to find um, like Loch Ness under there or are we looking at... Not little... with juice, we um... won't. <laughs> <laughs> no, so um, our... I'm, what, what, we, what we're thinking will be there is bacteria of some kind. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm trying to think back. It was maybe the 1980s. There was, a, there was a submersible that was sent to the deepest parts of the oceans on the Earth where it's really cold, really dark, and they found bacteria close to These vents. With, yes. Yeah, yeah. Those are the kind of things that we're thinking about. Amazing. Yeah. Really exciting. Um, I have a question for you from Professor Brian Cox. So should we have a listen to that? Of course. Okay. <laughs> Michelle, I have a question, and it's probably a very unscientific question. <laughs> so feel free to say I'm not answering that. But what I'd love to ask you is when juice arrives in Jupiter orbit and it makes those low flybys of Europa, perhaps it finds plumes uh, emanating from the oceans of Europa. Um, if I forced you to guess, do you think that we'll find evidence for biological activity in Europa's ocean? So what do you think? It's only a little question. I would be very surprised if we didn't. Mm. Um, we won't do it with the two juice flybys, but we might do it with the NASA Europa Clipper spacecraft that's got 50 flybys of mm. Europa. All you need to do is you need to find organic material in the plumes. And then the implication is that that organic material is coming out from the ocean itself. So these are going to collect kind of material from the plumes yes. to then analyze. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So, you know, I think of the three moons, Europa, Ganymede and Callisto. Europa is the one where we think it's liquid water is in contact with the silicate mantle. And so silicates will be leaking away from that mantle. But... Mm. If we can fly through a plume as it's going off, or if we can't have Clipper, NASA Clipper mission can fly through the plume, then we can almost taste what's in the plume. I mean, that sounds very exciting, but there's a little bit of time to wait, I guess. Oh, I know, we can, I know. Um, don't remind me. We can, we can do that, but maybe we'll see you back here in seven and a half years. Absolutely. Yeah, here's if I'm hoping. still standing, I'll be back here. Thank you, you. you will be. And we're going to talk about Loch Ness again. Okay. Um, maybe not. Um, so <laughs> we've come to the end of Summer Science Live. Fran, what exactly are you up to right now? Oh, do you know what, Roma? I am taking what I think is quite a well-deserved break. I've got a seat and I've got a refreshing drink right here. A very well-deserved break indeed, Fran. You were brilliant, by the way. Do you know what, Roma? You weren't bad yourself. Why don't you come down here, join me. I've got a drink with your name on it. I'll be with you any second now. Well, I've certainly had so much fun today. I have learned so much and had the opportunity to talk to some absolutely brilliant experts. We've traveled back in time. We've journeyed to the far reaches of the solar system and even had a slightly disconcerting poke around the inside of the human eye. I couldn't possibly pick a favorite exhibit because they were all pretty tremendous. The Summer Science Exhibition takes place every year at the Royal Society in London. So if you didn't manage to make it this year, please do take time to see us in 2024. In the meantime, once again, be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel and follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at Royal Society. And of course, please feel free to keep tweeting with the hashtag SummerScience. I've been Roma Agrawal, and I'm about to go join Fran for that refreshing drink. See you next year. <laughs>